the network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. Executive Center makes choosing a workspace simple. Award-winning interiors, prime locations, and personalized services. Enjoy complete flexibility when it comes to private offices, co-working, virtual offices, and events. Our team of experts will find what space works for you. The Executive Center.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to MIPIM Asia Awards 2020. My name is Desmond So, and I'm delighted to be your host for this digital format for this year's MIPIM Asia Awards. It's a huge pleasure to be with you here and to still be able to do this in spite of everything that's been going on in our world right now. While we won't have a chance to sit down and have a gourmet meal together this year, please grab a coffee or grab a tea because we'll be taking you through a one hour virtual journey and that will present all of the awards in this multifaceted projects across 11 categories in the Asia Pacific region. And this new format will still be joined by our jury members as well as winners. As a reminder to all of our winners, please ensure that you're online through our virtual conference. Upon entry into the chat room, please ping our VC manager and also hit the mute button, but you have to ping the VC manager to let them know that you have arrived. When a project is announced as a winner, please give the audience a quick wave, but because of time limitations, we'll be only inviting the gold winner to say a few short words. So all of you who are watching, welcome. We are very glad that you can join us. Feel free to post your comments and of course take pictures and post them online using the following hashtag, which is coming up on your screen now. It is hashtag MIPIM Asia Awards. Once again, that's hashtag M-I-P-I-M Asia Awards. Now I'd like to ask a very special person to join us online. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming MIPIM's director, Ronan Vespar, who is joining us live, I believe, from France, which I think is 6 a.m. over there. Good morning, Ronan. Yes, good morning, Desmond. Yes, indeed, it's 6 a.m. in Paris. Good afternoon in Hong Kong. So glad to be with you today and so disappointed I couldn't come to Hong Kong to be with you all. But clearly, uh, current circumstances did not allow me to, to, to travel. I would like to, to thank you all for being with us and to congratulate all the finalists who will uh, be celebrated uh, this year. 2020 was definitely a strange year, but together with Christine Lam, as the jury member chaired by Mr. Francois Trost, we decided to organize this MIPIM Asia Award ceremony in order to celebrate the stunning project of the MIPIM Asia Award this year. So, as you maybe remember, the jury decided some finalists, 33, the, the, the vote come for two thirds, and this year we did open also an online voting system for one third of the score. And to the jury members, you will discover that maybe some ranking did change a little bit. So, clearly you will enjoy the award ceremony and then insightful pitches from key industry real estate, uh, real estate industry leaders will, will uh, do uh, some keynotes to you all and will celebrate the winners of the startup competition afterwards. I would like to thank really much, you know, our two main partners for today, ESR and KPS. And last but not least, I wish you all of you a fantastic day and I declare open the MIPIM Asia Award Ceremony. Thank you very much, Desmond. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Ronan. Have a great day. At this time, I would like to introduce our amazing jury. Here they are. George Agathon from Ivanhoe, Cambridge. Margaret Broke from Professional Property Services Group. Henry Cheng from Chong Bang Group. Stanley Cheng from Citic Capital Holdings. Donald Choi from China Chem Group. Chris Chow from LaSalle Investment Management. Harvey Ko from Ernst & Young. Allison Koch from Star International Investment Advisors Asia Limited. Trip Gant from Washington State Investment Board. George Hong Choi from Link Asset Management Limited. Charles Lam from Bearing Private Equity Asia. Nicholas Liu from Chelsfield. Ellen M from Warburg Pincus. 
Shuji Tomakawa from Mitsui Fudosan Investment Advisors Incorporated. Nicholas Wong from the Townsend Group. Richard Yu from Arch Capital Management Company Limited. And last but not least, Francois Trauch, CEO and CIO of Alliance Real Estate GmbH and our jury chairman. At this time, it gives me great delight to welcome Francois, who's joining us online to share a few words. Francois, good to see you. Yes, uh, good to see you. Quite an amazing uh, jury. Uh, also amazing the fact that we are all here together in this new hybrid format, uh, which shows basically the resiliency of our industry. I think the resiliency is also shown uh, by the 114 projects which have been submitted, nearly the same amount than last year. It shows you that despite the pandemic, you know, people believe in Asia, people believe in real estate, people believe in good architectural and urban projects. And I think that's very reassuring for the future. Um, the jury spent a significant amount of time to go through the different projects. Uh, again, very impressed by the quality. The lion's share came out of China, 81 projects. And not only like previous year in sort of the mega category, but also interesting projects in categories like urban regeneration or mixed use projects. And like what I said last year, the quality of the project is increasing every year coming out of China. And then last year, remember the special jury award was for the National Kaichung Center of the Arts in Taiwan. This year, we have been very impressed by the creativity coming out of Hong Kong, 13 amazing projects coming out of, of, of Hong Kong and uh, more exciting news on this uh, very soon. So looking forward to an amazing hour. And as people say, the show should go on. Thank you very much, Francois. We'll see you again shortly. Thank you. Well, like Francois said, without further ado, let's get started with the awards. I'm excited and I hope you are too. The first award, of course, is very important to all of us. It is the best green development. Let's take a look at the nominees. K11 Atelier Kings wrote Hong Kong in Hong Kong SAR China. Tianai Carry Center in Shenzhen, China. And Ronson Technology Center in Beijing, China. To present for us, I'd like to invite Francois back onto the screen and he will announce our winners. Francois, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so here are the winners uh, of the Best Green uh, Development, very important award. The Bronze Award goes to Ronzin Technology Center in Beijing. Okay, uh, thank you and congratulations. The silver award for the best green development project goes to Shanghai Carry Center in Shenzhen. And finally, uh, the gold award for the best green development project, and I have the envelope here, opening it up. Not a lot of suspense. K11 at the DA Kings Road in Hong Kong. Congratulations. Congratulations. Can we invite our gold winner to say a few words for us, please? Right. Um, so can you hear me, guys? Yes, we can. Yes, good. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, this award. Uh, we, uh, we're so excited. Uh, I'm Edwin Chen from New World uh, um, Development Company Limited. Uh, K11, K Atelier King's Road, um, uh, we, are, we adopt the holistic approach for green and sustainable and healthy building. Um, so the building is a water platinum grade for green um, um, uh, lead and Hong Kong Bean Plus and also well certificate. Uh, we also apply the experimental ceiling green that we apply the green on the ceiling above the public plaza at the ground floor. So we can intro introduce a lot of extra greenery. So the final greenery coverage for the site is more than 2200% of the site area. Uh, Sorry, we, we do have to move on. So, urban... Sorry? Uh, we, we do have to move on. So can we uh, please wrap oh, it up? Yes. Thank um, you very so much. Very quickly, I know you're excited. Uh, thank you again. Um, 
Uh, thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry, due to time constraints, I know you have a lot to say and your, your project is very interesting. At this time, we'd like to take a photo, please. So on your screen right now, you'll see Francois and the three winners. Please look at your pinhole camera and on the count of three, we're gonna take a virtual snap of the screenshot, okay? So please look into your camera now. Big smiles, ready? One, two, three. Congratulations to all of our winners in the best green development. And of course, thank you very much, Francois. Our next okay. category is best hotel and tourism development. And like two years ago, maybe the gold winner will be hosting our jury meeting in the future. Who knows? Let's first meet our nominees. They are. Hebei Grand Hotel, Shi Jia Zhuang in China. Intercontinental Maldives Mamuna Gao Resort, Ra Atoll Maldives. And Kyoto Higashiyama Project, Sanso Kiyoyamato Park Hyatt Kyoto in Kyoto, Japan. And at this time, we'd like to invite Nick Liu, who will introduce our winners. Nick, please. Thank you. And the winners are bronze. Intercontinental Maldives Ma Munagao Resort. And the silver winner is Herbe Grand Hotel and You. And finally, the gold award goes to Kyoto Higashiyama Project, Park Hyatt, Tokyo. And, and, go ahead. and would the uh, winners like to say a brief word? Yeah. Okay. Uh could the winner say a few words for us? One minute, please, to the winner. Please share your moment with us. Okay. Is our winner there? Okay, let's take a photo at this time. Let's take a photo. Nick, please look into the camera on the left. And to our other winners, please look into your laptop camera. On the count of three, please, big smiles. One, two, three, cheers. All right, those were our winners in the best hotel and tourism development category. Congratulations and thank you very much, Nick. Now, of course, we're moving on to our third award. Our next category is new this year. Uh, probably a lot of you are very interested in this category. It's very meaningful. It's the best infrastructure community and civic building. Let's meet our nominees. They are ESR Amagasaki Distribution Center in Amagasaki, Japan. Hefei Fei River Central Smart Garden Library in Hefei, China. and Museum Tower Kiyobashi in Tokyo, Japan. At this time, we're delighted to have Harvey Ko join us and he will announce all three of our winners. Harvey, please. The bronze winner goes to Hefei Fei River Central Smart Garden Library. Congratulations. Pause for a second. Okay, just hang tight, ladies and gentlemen. These projects are so good, we wanted to show them to you a second time. Okay, so we're just gonna take a second and put the screen back on with our three winners. There we are. Harvey, could you announce the bronze winner again, please? The silver, uh, bronze? Bronze. The bronze winner goes to Hefei Fei River Central Smart Garden Library. Congratulations to our bronze winner.
And the silver winner goes to Museum Tower Kiyobashi. And finally, the gold winner goes to ESR Amagasaki Distribution Center. Congratulations. Congratulations. Very happy winner. Well, the winner would like to say a few words. Well, thanks, Harvey. Um, what a great start to the year. You've really, really made my year, my week already. Um, huge thanks to all of you guys on the, uh, on the panel, the judges, friends of ESR who voted for us. We're really delighted to see our project win a gold prize, the best infrastructure community in Civic Built Award. I'm happy to accept this on behalf of everyone at ESR, in particular our development team headed by Satoshi Takeda and our general contractor, Taisei Construction. Um, for every development, we really pride ourselves on the human-centric design philosophy, as well as playing a vital part in the global economy, whether it's distributing goods for digital economy or for distributing PPE or storing essential pharmaceuticals and vaccines, these buildings must also be highly desirable places to work for our customers and their workforce, and they must provide benefits for the surrounding community. This, for us, is a meaning of human-centric. Okay. We're always striving yes, to Yes, sir, thank sure you very much, but we have to wrap it up. So a few final words, please. You just broke my January dry drink drinking pledge, uh, Harvey, so thank you very much. I have the perfect excuse to have a drink. Cheers. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, Thank you very much. Now let's take a photo with Harvey and our winners. So please, Harvey, look into the left camera and to the other winners, please look into your lens. On the count of three, please. Big smiles for this photo. One, two, three. All right, congratulations. Those were your winners in the best infrastructure, community, and civic building. And thank you very much, Harvey. Next up is a category that challenges the architects. Yes, this is the best mixed use development. Let's first meet our nominees. They are Tianhai Carry Center in Shenzhen, China. Shibuya Station Area Redevelopment in Tokyo, Japan. And Victoria Dockside in Hong Kong, SAR, China. At this time, it gives me great delight to invite Ellen M and Nicholas Wong, who will jointly announce our winners to us. The winners are bronze is Shibuya Station Area Redevelopment. Congratulations. And the silver winner is Victoria Dockside in Hong Kong. The gold winner is Chin Hai Carry Center. Congratulations. The winner, Thank please you. say a few words. Thank you. It is our great pleasure that Chin Hai Carry Center is selected as the gold winner of the best mixed use development in the Minpit Asia Awards 2020. As the new landmark of our Carry Center portfolio in the Greater Bay Area, Chin Hai Carry Center embodies our people oriented architectural design while incorporating green building features to promote environmental sustainability. This award also demonstrates Gary Properties' reputation and experience in premium property development and management. We are grateful for the recognition. So, thank you, Minpit A. Schwartz, judges and everyone who has voted for us. Thank you. Congratulations, Tianhai Carry Center in Shenzhen. Thank you very much. That was best mixed use development. Congratulations to all of our winners. And of course, thank you very much, Ellen and Nick. Now we're gonna take a photo before we go. So please take a look into your cameras. Ellen and Nick, please look into the left camera and to our winners, please look into the center of your screens at your pinhole camera. On the count of three, please. One, two, three.
All right, congratulations once again to all of our winners and thank you very much, Ellen and Nick. We're gonna take a quick tune and break so everybody can stretch your legs, grab some water, grab some coffee, and we'll be back shortly. We'll see you in a little bit. Don't let them announce.
Hello and welcome back to the second half of the MIPIM Asia Awards 2020. Now just a quick housekeeping note, we're finding some of you have forgotten to turn on your cameras when you're in the waiting room and we don't want you guys to miss out on the photo. So please, if you're a nominee, once you're in the waiting room, be sure to turn your camera on so that we're ready for you when we take the photo. And also a reminder to our bronze and silver winners, please give a wave to acknowledge your win because we are taking photos over here. So it'd be nice for you to give a wave and then our gold winner will be invited to make a one minute speech. All right, let's move on. The next category is the best office development. Now, it might not sound like the most enticing category, but if you think about it, office is where we spend the majority of our lives. So let's take a look at the nominees. They are Daya Gate Ikebukuro Tokyo, Japan. K11 Italia Kings Road, Hong Kong, SAR, China. And Sequest Tower in Jakarta, Indonesia. Our next presenter will be joining us remotely. Please welcome Shuji Tomikawa, who will announce our winners for you for us. Shuji, please. Congratulations, now we would invite our winner to say a few words for us, please. The floor is yours for one minute. Thank you very much, congratulations. Now it's time for the photo. Let's give it a second. We're just gonna bring back on the winner. We're resetting the camera, so we're gonna bring back on the winner. Good. Take a photo. Please join Shuji in looking into your camera lens. Look in the center of your camera on the count of three. Big smiles, everybody. Ready? One, two, three. That was a good photo, I loved it. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all our winners in the best office development. And thank you very much, Shuji. Now, we don't always have to build from scratch to create wonders. The next category is going to prove this. I'd like to announce the best refurbished building. Let's first take a look at our list of nominees. We have Grand Gateway 66 renovation in Shanghai, China. Parkway Health Glen Eagles Hospital in Chengdu, China. And the rebuilding of the main building of Daimaru Shinsaibashi store in Osaka, Japan. We're delighted to have present for us Donald Choi. Let's give it a second. We have one of the winners who's still logging on. To that winner, please turn your camera on if you haven't done so already. Okay, let's move on. Donald, please announce our bronze right. winner for us. The bronze award winner is Parkway Health Grand Eagles Hotel. 
Please give a wave. Please give a wave. Yes, thank you. The silver winner goes to rebuilding of main building of Diamond Room, Shushabashi store. And the gold winner is Grand Gateway 66 renovation. Congratulations. Congratulations, Grand Gateway 66. Do we have somebody online there? Okay, so let's move on to a photo, please, with the other winners. Let's bring back on the screen with the photos. Hey, just hold tight for a second. Let's take a quick break. We're experiencing some minor technical difficulties, so let's take a quick break. Hang tight, everybody. We'll be back shortly. Thank you.
All right, and we're back. Thank you for joining us for the second part of our award ceremony. I want to ask you guys a question. Who hasn't bought something from Amazon or a similar online retailer this year? I mean, online shopping is fun, it's convenient, but it will never replace the pleasure of window shopping. The next category, best retail development, will hopefully prove this. Let's take a look at our nominees. They are K11 Museum in Hong Kong, SAR, China. Sanya CDF Mall 2 in Sanya, China. And with Harujuku in Tokyo, Japan. We're delighted to invite Stanley Ching and Chris Chow to announce the winners for us. Now we have a winner that is not on the screen, so I'm just gonna ask you if you have not turned on your camera. One of our nominees, okay. So gentlemen, please go ahead and announce our bronze winner, please. Okay, thank you very much. The uh, best retail de development bronze award goes to Sanya CDF Mall 2. Silver award goes to with Harajuku in Japan. Congratulations. And then the gold award goes to a very impressive project in Hong Kong, K11 Museum. Congratulations. Congratulations, K11 Museum here in Hong Kong. Hi, please say a few words for us for one minute, please. Retail, and I also personally, I would like to thank Adrian Jang for his ideas and support for the whole project and the 100 creative powers who make this a reality. Okay, most retail have only the interior space for people to shop around. But for us, we have a lot of exterior spaces for people to enjoy. For those who have not come to K11 Museum, please come and see the external spaces on sixth floor and the sunken court, ASAP, all right? Thank you very much. Congratulations, thank you. I'm lucky to live in Hong Kong because I am able to see that development. So very nice job. We're gonna take a photo now now, we're just gonna try and patch you guys back online because we've lost your image. We wanna make sure you're in the photo. So stay patient with us for one second. We're gonna reset the camera so that we can bring you back. K11 Museum, please continue to keep your camera on, please. We're bringing you back now. K11 Museum, are you there? We made it. We can hear you, but we can't see you. So we're gonna take a second to patch you in. Please be patient and make sure your camera is on. Thank you. Christine, we made it too. Is your camera on, guys? Yes, our camera is on. Camera's on, okay. Give hold us on, a second. Hold on.
Do you, do you see, uh, there is a button that we see, we are still seeing a video mute over here on our side. Do you see a video mute? Video mute. Hold on, hold on. Sorry about the, 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 the hiccups in here. Let, let, our, let our teammate resolve that. We are too excited, probably. Our fingers are not working properly now. Okay. Have we made an image to click now, or have we made an image to click? Do you see our image? Uh, no, no, I'm afraid we have to move on. So let's take a photo now on screen with, with Harajuku. Okay, so let's look at the cameras, please, gentlemen, on the left. Camera on the left. With your Juku, okay. please look okay. in the center okay. of your camera. Okay. Big smiles. Yeah. One, Thank two, you. Three. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations to our winners and thank you very much, Stanley and Chris. Moving on, our next category is the Best Urban Regeneration Project. Let's take a look at our list of nominees. They are... Vanki Sugar Town, Chuanzhou, China. Xi'an Dahua, 1935 in Xi'an, China. And Xuhui Runway Park in Shanghai, China. For the Best Urban Regeneration Project, we'd like to invite George Agathon to present for us. We have one of the winners who is still waiting to come on screen. Okay. Please make sure that your cameras are on to all our nominees. So mm -hmm. Van Ki Sugar, Xi'an Dahua, and Xu Hui Runway, please turn your cameras on so we have you here on the screen, please. Good, we have someone who's come back onto the screen. Good, we're patching everybody in now. Good, one more. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's announce the bronze winner, please, George. Thanks. The bronze winner for the Best Urban Regeneration Project is Xi'an Dahua, 1935. Congratulations. Please give a wave. Yes, congratulations. And the silver winner for the best urban regeneration project is Xuhui Runway Park. Congratulations. And the gold winner for the best urban regeneration project, Vanki Sugar Town. Congratulations. Okay, we'd like to invite the winner, Vanki Sugar Town. Please say a few words for us. One minute to say a few words. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't breathe. <laughs> Actually, I, I can't breathe. Uh, I think the other uh, two parts is uh, uh, also very, very good. Actually, we see see the project uh, before, uh, like the Xi'an, uh, the Dahua project in Xi'an and, uh, uh, and the runway project in Xuhui, they are, they are, uh, uh, they co they complete very, very good, I think. And, um, <laughs> and, and I, I think maybe we, we, we can got a, a bronze or the silver, but I, I can't believe we got the first uh, place. Uh, thank you uh, for the committee and thank you uh, for your agreement with us, because the project is uh, um, uh, is quite hard for us. It lasts for uh, uh, four years, yes. Um, and 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 yeah, the project generates the city. Yes. A, a few more okay, words. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 And the project will generate the city uh, in the north part of uh, Chengdu, and, and that's all, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations. Let's take a photo together. So, uh, George, please look at the camera on the left there, and 
To the winners, please look into your cameras right now. Look into your laptops on the count of three. Let's take a photo. Big smiles, everybody. Thumbs up, big smiles. Ready? One, two, three. Good, congratulations. Thank you to our winners in the Best Urban Regeneration Project. And thank you very much, George Agathon. Now, if I had a magic ball, I'd be able to look into the future to, to predict upcoming trends. But until that happens, we'll depend on the next category. That is Best Futura Project. Let's take a look at the nominees. We have Airside Hong Kong in Hong Kong, SAR China. Anta Sports Campus in Shanghai, China. In commercial development at Murray Road, Hong Kong, SAR, China. We're delighted to have with us Mr. Richard Yu, who announced the winners. A reminder, please, when you're on camera, please switch off your mics, but make sure your camera is on. Thank you very much. Richard, please go ahead and announce our bronze winner for us. Uh, thanks, Desmond. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I'm pleased to announce the winners of the Best Futura Project, two of which are actually located in Hong Kong. Ah. Uh, first, the bronze winner goes to Antai Sports Campus, architect, NBBJ, developer Anti Group. Congratulations. The silver award goes to Two Murray Road in Hong Kong. Architect Saha Hadid, architects uh, with Ronald Lu in Hong Kong, developer Henderson Land. Architect Saha Hadid. Congratulations. Ronald Lu in Hong Kong. And finally, Henderson the whole winner, of course, uh, Airside. Uh, also in Hong Kong, to the gold winner, our gold winner project. Yep. Airsai, we know you're there. We're just going to take a second to bring you back. Hang tight with us. There you are, yeah. Airsai. Congratulations. 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 So you want to take a, uh, a minute to uh, to say a few words, please? Okay. Thank you. Hello. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the. Uh, Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for the uh, Go Award. I would like to give my wholehearted appreciation to my entire project team members. Um, it's all about the teamwork. Uh, ASI will be Langfeng's highlighted commercial development to create an iconic landmark in the new CBD of Hong Kong. This 1.9 million square foot retail office development will create a new urban lifestyle experience, anchoring a wholeness to invite everyone and the community as well as fostering innovation and sustainability. At last, please do remember, stay cool with us for our opening next year. May I wish everyone have the best coming future like ASI. Thank you. Thank you very much, ASI. Congratulations. And once again, congratulations to all our best Futura projects. Let's take a photo at this time. Okay. Please look into your cameras and Richard, please look into the left camera. On the count of three, big smiles, everybody. One, two, three. All right, that was a great photo. We had a lot of thumbs up in that photo. I liked it. Okay, that was the best Futura project. Thank you very much, Richard. This brings us to our final category, which is the best Futura mega project. Let's first take a look at our nominees. We have Pan Long Tian Di in Shanghai, China. Tencent Da Chao Wan Net City in Shenzhen, China. And Xinyang University South Bay Campus, Henan, China. Okay, beside me, we have Mr. Charles Lim, who will announce the winners for us. Charles, please go ahead and announce the bronze winner. Sure, thanks. The best Futura Mega project, the bronze award goes to Xinyang University South Bay Campus. Congratulations. Congratulations.
The silver award goes to Tencent Da Changwa Net City. Congratulations! So the gold award is obviously goes to Penang Tianti. So may I invite the winner, the gold winner, to say a few words? Congratulations again. All right, one minute to say a few words for us, please. All right, one minute to say a few words for us, please. Sure. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mipim. This is Albert Chen of Sharon Land. Uh, it's our honor to receive this award. I'd like to give uh, our thanks to our team, especially Sasaki, which did the master plan for us, and Benwood and Office, which did the uh, uh, historic city center for us and also Tempo, which is the uh, residential for us. Uh, this is a community that we redevelop, which uh, resurrect the old town of Panlong uh, in Qingpu in Shanghai and uh, adapt and reuse. And we would like to create a landmark destination uh, combining culture, sustainability and community together and also have a uh, create a very sustainable lifestyle for the citizens that uh, would be living there and also enjoying our uh, uh, town center. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and congratulations, Pan Long Tian Di. We're going to take a group photo at this time. Okay, so everybody, please look into your cameras. Charles, please look into the camera on the very left. Okay, on the count of three, please. One. Two, three, cheers. Okay, thank you very much. And congratulations to our winners once again. Thank you very much, Charles. Now there was one category, of course, that was very meaningful. We were having tech difficulties before, but we are able to bring it to you now. Dreams come true when you feel safe and comfortable in your own homes. The final category speaks to this about your dream homes. It's the best residential development. Let's take a list, look at our nominees. We have Cloud Villa in Shanghai. Eden in Singapore. and Hado Hiljo Townhouse, Jeju-do in South Korea. Delighted to have with us Charles again, who will announce the winners for us. Charles, please. Thank you. For the Best Residential Development Awards, the bronze award goes to Hado Hiljo Townhouse. Congratulations. Congratulations, our bronze winner, Hado Hiljo Townhouse. And the silver award goes to Cloud Villa. Silver. 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 Oh, yes, it's silver. Cloud Villa, Shanghai. Congratulations. So, Eden is the gold winner. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Are our winners there? The gold. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, can I invite the go award winner to say a few words? Hello. 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 Yeah, we can hear you. Hi, 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 Charles. Hi, this is Adrian Tong from Swipe Properties. Um, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Pim, and the uh, organizing <laughs> committee. Uh, it is a great honor of Swipe Properties to be able to uh, receive such an important award today. And Ethan's success, of course, uh, is thanks to the entire project design team. Uh, including but not limiting to uh, Tom, uh, Thomas Hedwig Studio. We are very happy to share this uh, happy moment with you all right. today. Uh, again, once again, thank you, Mipin, and you all. Um, uh, thank you. We are very, very uh, delightful. Thanks. Congratulations. Let's take a photo at this time. Okay, let's bring back the screen. Let's see if, okay, we're having people coming back here. Give us a second. <laughs> Okay, let's bring back our winners here. Try and take a photo. 
Okay, Charles, please look at the camera on the left. Looking straight ahead into your cameras, please, on the count of three. One, two, three. Congratulations to our best residential development and thank you once again to Charles. That final category wraps up our awards ceremony. Let's give a big round of applause virtually to all of the winners and nominees from all around Asia. And hopefully this will be our first, but hopefully our last virtual ceremony. We hope we'll get to meet all of you in person at the end of this year for the 2021 MIPIM Asia Awards. Now to close out this year's ceremony, it's my delight to welcome Christine Lam, Asia Pacific Director at Reed Minim. Christine. Congratulations to all the winners of the 14th edition of the MIPIM Asia Awards. My apologies for some of the technical hiccups as this was the first time that we've done this virtually. Many special thanks to each of our jury members who met fidgetly, um, who contributed their valuable time to review all of the submissions on November the 12th. That was, as I mentioned, our first digital experience on which the jury met in Hong Kong, while our jury chairman, Mr. Francois Troche, joined us from Europe, uh, Suji, Su Suji Tomikawa-san from Tokyo, as well as Henry Chang from Shanghai. I would also like to thank over 3,000 MIPIM Asia past clients who were invited to cast their votes online to help us determine the final ranking of the gold, silver, and bronze prize winners. Um, with the current social distancing measures, unfortunately, we were not able to organize our normal award ceremony. Um, today, we announced the winners, but I want to remind all of you that all the winners will be invited to join our live presentation with your trophy when we host MIPIM Asia 2021 at the end of this year. So please mark your diary to join us. Uh, the best is yet to come. Please stay tuned for our Leaders Perspective Series interview with key industry leaders, which will start now. Thank you. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries.
The Executive Center makes choosing a workspace simple. Award-winning interiors, prime locations, and personalized services. Enjoy complete flexibility when it comes to private offices, co-working, virtual offices, and events. Our team of experts will find what space works for you. The Executive Center. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. Welcome back and a fresh welcome to others. Welcome to the MIPIM Asia Awards Forum. 
Now, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Desmond So, and I'm delighted to be your host for this digital version of MIPIM Asia Awards Forum. The MIPIM Asia Awards Forum is a digital edition allowing followers to learn from Asia industry leaders to gauge the risks and rewards and key success factors for Asian markets and to effectively apprehend cultural specificities. In the next two hours or so, I have the pleasure of speaking with industry leaders and experts to get their perspectives on hot topics. We're going to get started right away. I'm delighted that our first speaker is Stanley Cheng, Senior Managing Director, Managing Partner, and Head of Real Estate Group at Citic Capital Holdings Limited. Thank you. Welcome. Nelson. Now, Stanley, congratulations, first of all, on Herfe ID Mall winning the Mixed Use Development Gold Award in 2017, and Lane 189 also picked up the Best Retail Development. Of course, with everything that's going on in the world right now, retail the sector has experienced a, a lot of challenges with the lockdowns and social distancing measures imposed by various governments around the world. How has China performed this past year? Well, um, Desmond, I think you are giving me a, a very uh, easy and a difficult question. <laughs> um, I think you know, basically um, the retail sector has been hit the hardest uh, during the pandemic. And uh, China uh, was not an exception. However, I think China has done a tremendous job uh, in order to bring the business back to normal. Um, I can still recall that what happened that the uh, government just annou uh, announced the lockdown. Pretty much all the social activities, commercial activities uh, in mid of uh, February last year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it caught everyone by surprise because at that time, uh, Wuhan, you know, there was an outbreak and other cities seems that not that bad, but the government made a very decisive decision uh, just to close down everything. So we were affected uh, uh, very badly uh, because we own a couple of shopping malls. Mm. Um, all, this, uh, all, the, all, the, all the shopping malls has to, uh, to be closed except for the uh, supermarket pharmacy and uh, the uh, daily necessity shops. Mm -hmm. So we don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, we don't know uh, what is the next step by the government. But uh, very fortunately, I think that that was the right decision uh, to close down everything, to lock down everything, because very soon China was very much under control. The mm -hmm. pandemic was very much under control in many of the uh, provinces and the cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, starting from late of uh, uh, March and, uh, and, uh, and early uh, April, we were allowed to gradually to reopen the business. Mm. So they started uh, very smartly that uh, allowed the retail shops that uh, you don't, well, you, you don't have uh, too many people together to start first, mm. to, you know, to resume the business first, mm. then gradually extend it to F uh, food and beverages. And uh, by almost like uh, July or August, that even the uh, most constant, you know, the, the, the areas that the, that the, uh, uh, the government had the hardest uh, control, uh, for example, like the cinemas, the uh, kids, like uh, playgrounds, they were all allowed to reopen. But still, the measures was there. And so if we look at the number, I'm very fortunate that, uh, you know, I have the, you know, the first hand uh, uh, number to show uh, our audience mm -hmm. that, um, that um, in general, the retail business in China uh, in last year uh, was hit hard in February, uh, March, and April, but rebounded very quickly. Mm. And so if we look at all years, you know, the whole year uh, number, um, basically the total sales is about 85 to 90% back to normal, mm. comparing with nine, uh, 2019. Not bad at all. And if we look at the NOIs, because the government also provided some incentives, uh, they uh, cut the tax, they uh, allowed the, you know, maybe a late repayment of the, uh, the, uh, the bank loans. Mm. So that helps uh, also uh, very much to the, uh, to the operators. So if we look at the NOI number, the net operating income uh, number, uh, that was down by like, a, between five to 10% mm. uh, for our portfolio. So if we, if we look at this number and compare with you know, elsewhere in the world, I think that is a very impressive number, uh, impressive number. That's not all. If we look at the luxury sectors, they actually perform better than oh. 2019. Okay. Um, if, you know, if you look at our uh, winner, uh, the, the, uh, the, the earlier winner, uh, Henlong uh, uh, Plaza 66, I think they, their number in 2020 is much better than uh, 2019, mm. and they expect that trend to continue. 
because I think because of the lockdown, people cannot travel uh, to uh, overseas for uh, shopping for leisure, mm -hmm. so they all stay in China to spend the money. You know, you know, the still still there is a demand for them to purchase luxury uh, uh, goods, mm -hmm. and there's a still uh, you know an appetite for uh, you know nice things. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, for the luxury uh, shopping malls, luxury brands, they outperformed uh, most of the other sectors. So I, I would say, you know, China really recovers very, very smoothly and quickly. I think that's a attributed to few factors. One is the very uh, decisive decision by the government to lock down everything mm. um, and, and to control the pandemic. And the second is also uh, the uh, industry, uh, op, you know, the players like ourselves, the shop owners, uh, the uh, shopping mall owners, they all work together to find a solution. Mm. And, uh, you know, before you know, business back basically uh, back, back to normal. So I think we are looking forward a very strong year next year. Uh, I mean, this year, 2021. Okay. Now, you, you had touched on this already. There, there's a travel ban. That's why you're saying there might be more uh, domestic spending because people can't travel. Now, with the limit on travel, do you, do you see investment opportunities increasing or decreasing in the coming year? Well, I think it's a still... A little bit too early to tell, uh, but I I would argue that uh, we are still seeing very uh, you know strong demand uh, f from from the investors' mm. perspective. First of all, because of the pandemic, uh, people actually see China as a country as a, you know basically is the most stab stabilized. Mm. Um, you know all the performance, all the uh, uh, and, and and rebound very quickly, and this is a sector probably that the people will look for more opportunities. They will see, you know, if we, gro if we look at the global uh, 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 space, that uh, China probably is a place that people might want to increase their exposure. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, I think most of the, uh, I would say, significant investors, uh, they all have a presence in China. So China, within China, there's no travel ban. People, their team in China, based in China, they can still travel, they can still, you know, do due diligence, to still do uh, uh, project visits. And on the other hand, because of the, uh, you know, in general, uh, people will see, uh, uh, because of the pandemic also have some, some, some uh, impact to, for example, developers, some of the asset owners, they might want to, you know, lower their price a little bit. So making the, the investment uh, opportunity more attractive mm. to, to some of the investors, I would say. So I would not, um, I, I think the, the transaction uh, activity in China will still be pretty stable, I would say. If, but then, again, if it uh, compares uh, with uh, uh, other parts of the world, I think they, they certainly will outperform. Outperform, okay. Yeah. Are there any regions in China or specific sectors uh, that, that you would bring attention to that you would find especially attractive? Well, I think the, uh, if the people look at it, and then uh, the most, uh, the sector that benefits a lot, uh, or obviously, the benefiting from the pandemic is the uh, uh, two sectors. One is the logistics; mm -hmm. the other one is the uh, uh, the IDC, the uh, uh, which that you use uh, you need to use a lot of data because people shop sure. more online, and then there's more data centers uh, in need. Mm -hmm. And logistics centers, people will think, uh, well, you know, people yeah. on the other hand, you know, they actually increase their their shopping activities online, and then you know, there's a need for uh, logistics. Yeah, for sure, because they're, they're definitely friends of mine or relatives yeah. who have never touched online retail before, but this year has changed all of that. Yes, so definitely, yeah. But, you know, with still Arg, there are other opportunities. Uh, we like retail as well. We like office as well. So it just re really depends on which sector you're looking at and where are the value you are going to, uh, to find. Okay, Stanley, thank you very much thank for you. sharing. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, good to be here.
Our next interview will be conducted by Nicholas Wong, partner at the Townsend Group. I will now invite him on stage and he will introduce his guest. Thank you, Desmond. Good morning, Francois. Uh, just to let you know that I paid big money to replace Desmond to interview you. <laughs> good, good luck. Don't give up your day job. Thank you very much for chairing the 14th edition of MIPIM Asia uh, Awards. Um, please share with us what you thought of this year's submission compared to the last few years. Well, listen, I think what strikes me when I look at the submissions and we together went, went through it is the, the large amount of submissions coming from China. So, you know, whatever you say about China, you know, the country is moving, the projects are coming in. I mean, 81 projects in the middle of the pandemic and China w was hit early on in that crisis uh, and through good management got out of it early as well. Uh, as Stanley was just saying before. Um, and so for me, that just shows, of course, it's a big country, so it's normal that you have a lot of projects, but it also shows that the quality of, I think, what's being done now in, in real estate in China is, is really Im improving. You, you have now urban regeneration program, which you didn't see some years before, retail repositioning projects. Uh, so there's a lot to be learned, I think, from, uh, from what's, what's happening in China. And then, as I mentioned in my int introduction, uh, I was just surprised by Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong has had a rough year, you know, uh, when you think about it. All sort of crises happening at the same time. And despite all of that, I saw the projects coming out of Hong Kong were creative, uh, innovative, uh, quite daring, uh, like the K11 uh, uh, complex and the retail. Um, so it shows you that uh, communities have a way to, uh, to go on and, and survive despite, you know, either the uncertainty uh, or, or, or events which can happen. So in, in, in a year or in a, where maybe people are not so optimistic, I think these are all sorts of optimism for me as, as an institutional investor. Oh, great. Thanks, Francois. Well, you know, Allianz is one of uh, the largest uh, real estate investors in the world. Like, obviously, we are still facing a lot of challenges uh, because of COVID. How about for you as a real estate investor? Uh, what do you see around the world and what are your challenges, key challenges? Uh, for this year or maybe in the next few years? I think the, the challenge of most institutional investors is that they want and need to invest in real estate. Okay, uh, the, the asset class became indispensable in a portfolio construct uh, in a low yield environment. Okay, so there is definitely, as an investment manager on behalf of Allianz, there is definitely a pressure to invest. Then the question is, you know, how do you do that in, in, in the current environment? Um, you would have thought that maybe, of course, the COVID situation uh, was an impediment. And to some extent it is, because if you cannot travel, if you cannot see the assets, um, it's very difficult. I think I would say it's impossible to make acquisitions where we, Allianz, made a choice, which in a way paid off last year and this year, that we decided to have a lot of regional and local offices with local teams, not all the teams in one location, either Singapore or Paris or New York, we have multiple offices in all three continents and that enable us to keep going. If, you, if today you don't have an office in China, it's very difficult uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to do meaningful business there uh, and keep the pace of investment. So that was one, I think, uh, uh, of the lessons. The, the second aspect is a matter of you know, calculated risk, meaning you are in an environment where, where because of the unprecedented support the governments are giving as well, I think that was one of the lessons learned from this COVID crisis, is that governments did whatever it took uh, and uh, in, in terms of plans you know, to, to help the economy. And that sort of ensured a low interest rate environment. And that, of course, sort of the bedrock of uh, real estate investments. You know, if, if, if you believe that rates will remain low, I think you can be a little bit more daring in, in your investment policy. And then finally comes, you know, your assessment on, um, on the industry, on, on the sectors, you know, because they are, fortunately or unfortunately, they will be winners and losers. You know, some sectors will do better than others. Some cities will do better than others. Some buildings will be better than others. That's the, the beauty of, of, of real estate. And therefore, you know, you have to then be vigilant. And on top of things, to invest in, in those sectors where the NOI grows uh, will, will, will come out. I think an element uh, Stanley also mentioned in his previous uh, segment. Great. 
Francois, you used to be an Asia CEO. Now you're a global CEO. How does uh, Asia stack up compared to other opportunities around the world? Um, I think Asia stacks up uh, very well. It, it, it stood up quite well in 2020. Actually, Asia was our biggest uh, geography in terms of investment amount. You know, uh, over 1.2 billion invested in, uh, in, in that region. Uh, so uh, definitely in a, a region of focus. Because Asia managed the crisis quite well, the COVID crisis, and it's sort of, in a way, I mean, out of it is, is a big word, but you know, has managed it quite well. Look at the growth rate in China, you know, expected to be around 8% uh, this year. Uh, so definitely, if you're looking for growth areas, I think uh, uh, Asia remains uh, still one of the best regions. It's not the only one. You know, I think we need to watch the U.S. I know the U.S., is going through a difficult time as well, but the unprecedented stimulus which is coming with the new administration will definitely boost the economy uh, over the next uh, 18 months. Then, of course, Asia is also uh, the mega trends, uh, which we are looking for in our investments. We want to invest with conviction. And uh, one mega trend is, of course, what we call the beds and sheds, you know, logistics uh, and, and residential. And if you look at logistics, it's it's a, it's a it's a global asset class and 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 Asia uh, is just a, a part of it like a third of it. So we continue to invest uh, in in logistics in Asia. The second aspect is residential. Um, a country like Japan offers extremely good, uh, in my view, risk-adjusted returns for residential uh, through a combination of very stable NOI and 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 very competitive financing. Uh, so that's another segment, you know, in which we have positioned ourselves uh, quite a lot. And then finally, you have urbanization. The urbanization is still ongoing. And, and um, I know in Europe or maybe in the US, people have questions, work from home, will people want to live in big cities? We took the view that once the COVID is finished, big cities, dense cities, urbanized areas are still going to be the areas in which you should invest because they gather the most opportunities for, for, for people, for young people. They offer the, the best choice of, of potential users when you have a building there. And of course, you know, uh, there is no other region in the world which, uh, you know, is characterized by urbanization if you look at the top cities in the world. So if you, if you believe in that model and you believe that um, people will want to live in big cities, go to the office, maybe with the flexibility as a complement to work from home from time to time, and then I think uh, Asia remains uh, a very attractive part uh, of the world for a, a global investor like us, and, and we will continue to focus uh, on that region uh, with the team uh, under the leadership of, of Raj Desai, which we have over there. Well, it looks like logistics is hot on uh, everybody's uh, strategy. So after COVID, have you adjusted your strategy at all, or you're basically doing the same thing? You think this is just an aberration? COVID is just maybe just wipe out 2020. You keep going on, or you have adjusted your strategy? I think what COVID has done, it has uh, focused our strategy on things which we had already identified before, uh, meaning. Logistics was already uh, an asset class which uh, you know institutional investors uh, were, were going into. Uh, I think uh, COVID has just accelerated uh, the desire to increase your allocation to that asset class. Uh, the, 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 the impact of technology on real estate was uh, already there. I think uh, COVID has accelerated it and therefore designing the office not just as a place to work or, or even less so a place to do emails, but a place to exchange or a place to do events, I think has become uh, even stronger. I think the one area which, in my view, has really come even stronger out of COVID is uh, ESG. The, the focus on developing uh, green buildings, uh, sustainable buildings, buildings which basically will get you to a, uh, a carbon neutral status uh, by 2050, uh, which is basically the goal of the European Union. Um, and with the Paris Accord, which the US uh, as rejoining will become as well. And, and China is already very well focused on that. So I think we should not underestimate how important it will be, not just for tenants and users, but also for investors to basically position themselves on buildings, um, which basically have the highest uh, green standard. And by that, I, I just don't mean just uh, to have, you know, a, a green certificate, but a true path of reduced uh, energy intensity and carbon footprint, which can be reduced every year 
on that uh, path towards a, a zero emission uh, portfolio um, at the end of that period. I think that is really, COVID has been, uh, strangely enough, uh, an accelerator uh, of, uh, of that aspect. Thank you, Francois. It has been a pleasure interviewing you. Nick, Nick, it was a pleasure to exchange with you as always. Okay, thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye. Well, our next conversation will be with Donald Choi, Chief Executive Officer of China Chem Group. Donald, welcome. Hello. Earlier, I had spoken with Stanley, and he had told us that, you know, of course, the retail sector has been one that has been hit pretty hard. Another one, of course, is hotel and hospitality. It's suffering, mm. but reinvesting itself at the same time across the globe. As an investor in various right. assets, including a hotel group, what are the biggest challenges ahead for the Asian hotel sector? Well, I think it's finding a new business model, really. I think we see a lot of uh, travelers that are going to stay home. Uh, business find out that they don't really need to travel to do business. Mm. Uh, working at home is just as efficient. So we really uh, need to find a new business model where you know, the hotel is not just a room to stay in and sleep, but actually it offer kind of uh, unique experience you know, mm. for people to gather together. And for us, um, especially, we will be looking for the uh, long stay, co-living, the uh, staycation, staycation for the local. Yeah. I think all of those actually require the hotel operations to change their traditional mode of practice. Mm. And you know, it is not just uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, before the COVID, I think we already see uh, competitors uh, with very innovative, disruptive business model coming in. For example, Airbnb. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's back to how we can use the hotel platform to really create a community of you know, people, uh, travelers, that they no longer just use the physical space of the hotel but they actually you know, uh, use the platform created by the hotel operation to uh, make connection with business partner, with friends, and enjoy a really uh, unique experience mm -hmm. when they come to you know, the particular place. Yeah, you, know, you, you talk of this business model change. Once again, this, this word staycation, some people mm -hmm. were familiar with the term before, but now I think it's, it's really entered the mainstream vernacular. Mm -hmm. And it's, you, you almost ask who this year didn't have a staycation, <laughs> right? Now, from an investment standpoint, Donald, do you think uh, the hotel investment will change or evolve in the future as we cope with COVID-19 or something similar in the future? Well, I think when we look at the um, hot assets, um, I think, as I mentioned just now, it's not just the room that matters. So, you know, the ability to provide more common space, uh, amenities, you know, to support the guests, you know, using the hotels, all of those um, additional value-added service become very important. So for the investor, I think when you look at investing in your hotel, you are not just looking into a hard asset, but also the software support, the operation, the amenities, the ability of the hotel to offer something else. Now, if someone was listening to this and they're a hotel operator, mm -hmm. given what you, you say, would, would you recommend that they refurbish and, and increase their common space or mm -hmm. change their physical space, like you mm -hmm. said, because it seems like the traditional hotel room mm -hmm. is not enough? Yeah. Well, it's not just uh, adding common space. 
I think also people are very much uh, conscious about hygiene, uh, you know, clean air, and also a lot of other you know, facilities that they consider could be not safe in a sense, you know, previously, you know, um, common changing room, you know, how comfortable are you, you know, in those places. So again, I think physical revamp, uh, renovation to address all these issues is important. Um, so, you know, hardware, you know, while it is not, you know, the only important thing, it is important in the sense that we can increase the comfort level, the hygiene, safety, uh, comfort. Okay, I'm going to make you pull out your crystal ball here and ask you the next question, which is, you know, uh, the hotel hospitality sector mm. has been hit hard. Yes. When do you see a, a rebound from COVID, maybe both in terms of this region and around the world, because obviously the measures have been different. Yeah. I think Asia will bounce a little bit faster. Um, again, it's not just only because of the vaccine or COVID, but because the economy in Asia, actually, especially in China, uh, we are seeing a positive growth, so that is good. Um, but it will be in phases, so I think you know, we wouldn't get back to the pre-COVID market, uh, probably in you know, three to five years time. Uh, and we are going to see quite a change in the market as well. As I mentioned, business traveling uh, will not be as frequent. Um, but again, as you mentioned, the staycation, the local travelers is really uh, going to grow. And if you have a large country like China, you know, people can travel from city to city, uh, really still within their own country, which makes traveling much more easier. So investment in Asia, especially in China, still there are a lot of opportunities. Donald, for my last question for you, I want to bring it back to the awards. Mm. Uh, was there any project this year that was especially significant in your mind or differentiated itself from projects of years past? Well, I think we see uh, quite a number of very high quality refurbishment uh, projects. I think that actually is uh, good trend as well, you know, because for city development, um, you know, a lot of history, uh, culture has been embedded into the existing city. We don't need to demolish and rebuild everything. By revitalization of existing building, uh, adaptive reuse, we really actually is adding to the richness of cities. And I think for real uh, estate developer, um, as uh, Francois mentioned, I think the big city is still something that offer a lot of opportunities because it offer um, you know, different things to different you know, people. And refurbishment is a way to actually retaining some of those treasure of the old city as well as adding something new to the future user. Very good point, Donald. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much. Nice talking to you. Hi, Nicholas. Thank you very much for leading us on that very fascinating discussion with Francois earlier. And also, thank you for your contributions over the years in helping guide the jury in evaluating projects submitted to the urban regeneration category. Now, we know you were involved and consulted on numerous regeneration projects in Hong Kong, including Blue Cluster House, which was the gold winner in 2017. Can you share with us some of the challenges and maybe joys and sorrows of that project, please? I think this is uh, one of, uh, well, I'm a Hong Kong born, raised uh, Hong Kong, uh, so uh, definitely knows this building very, very well. Uh, visited many, many times. And I think it's up to the uh, jury to, of, of course, there's a committee in Hong Kong that actually select all these uh, projects that's worthy of uh, regeneration. 
This is one of the very unique one because it's in uh, the old, very old area and also have very unique uh, architectural design. Um, the challenge is, of course, is convincing uh, the owner and then also the community, this is the, the project to be preserved. Mm -hmm. Now, are public-private partnerships important, and maybe I take it, take it a step further, not only important, but crucial to success of urban regeneration projects? Um, I, I think definitely is uh, very crucial because firstly, private, a lot of Hong Kong buildings are privately owned. They're not publicly owned. But at the same time, it's in the public interest to preserve uh, the city's culture. So therefore, the public side needs to convince the private side. And many times, the public needs to provide some, some kind of compensation in order for the owner to pres preserve that particular project. So I think that cooperation is very, very uh, essential. Um, you know, I'll give you one example. For example, the, uh, the residents of Bruce Lee in Kowloon Tong. Although a lot of people wanted to preserve that building because Bruce Lee is such a significant character of Hong Kong, but because uh, that cooperation somehow didn't work out, so that building uh, eventually was demolished um, and it was not uh, funded properly and then the owner didn't have the funding to continue to preserve the building because it's getting old. So I think that's one uh, prime example of the failure of this uh, private and public partnership. Mm. Now, that's a good point because sometimes public interest and private interests do conflict. Um, can you give some insight into when that conflict comes up, how it can be resolved, uh, or, or how the two sides can kind of meet eye to eye? Well, you know, I think Hong Kong is unique it's like because Hong Kong is densely populated, and then it also has one of the highest real estate value of, in the world. Mm. Um, and all the buildings in general have lower density, therefore, is not worth a lot. So when you redevelop and then build to the highest possible, then of course it generates a lot more value. Mm. So therefore, I think many a times that the government needs to provide some certain compensation. But at the same time, this compensation come out from the taxpayer's money. Yeah. If this money needs to be a big, big substantial, that a lot of people would say, well, you're transferring wealth from one part of the society into the owner mm -hmm. of this uh, part. Mm -hmm. uh, another example on the mid uh, level, for example, on Stops Road, mm -hmm. there was a, a, a big project that had uh, historic Chinese characteristics. The green tiles, yes. yes. Eventually that was also demolished yep. because obviously the government could not afford to pay the owner all this money mm -hmm. to preserve the building. Mm -hmm. and then, the, so it, it's a shame. So I think, uh, I think Hong Kong is unique is that you know, you worth so much money on mm -hmm. for this kind of a historic historic location. Okay, well, you've talked about Hong Kong and some of the uh, specific uh, challenges here. I want to bring it up a little bit, Asia in general. In Asia, do you see any countries that can benefit or should be more proactive in urban regeneration projects? I think some countries, like for example, Australia, I'll give you also a sample, is like most of the building with a facade, they are preserved. And then you build new building behind that. But it is a government policy has been there for a long time. So when new owner come in to buy that project, that aspect has already incorporated into the calculation. Mm. Therefore, they are able to, to do that. Um, for like cities like Beijing or, or Shanghai, for example, is government driven. The government wants to preserve that because they have they know these are a, a strong culture because that, um, so I think, you know, obviously those are, have had a lot of success. Yeah. Okay, my, my final question is the same one that I asked Donald earlier. In this year's projects, was there anyone that was significant for you, uh, either from a, a design or a personal feeling that you just had for the project that stuck out in your mind? Well, I think definitely a K-11 is that project because, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I, I was raised in Hong Kong, so I used to go to the New World Center mm. uh, when I was very, very young. And then that was already command a panoramic view of Hong Kong Island. Of course, it's already uh, a very significant project, but it was uh, torn down yes. and then totally rebuilt into a, of course, it's a fantastic project, mm. you know, in, in every aspect. But of course, obviously, a New World Group, uh, you know, spare no expense yeah. to redevelop that. And therefore, 
you know, it turned out to be, you know, such a gem. Mm. And I think with that location and with that structure, I think definitely is, is the new landmark of Hong Kong. Yeah, for sure. I think for anyone who was, uh, has lived long enough to see the old site of where New World used to be, it really is a game changer. It is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Desmond. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. The Executive Center makes choosing a workspace simple. Award-winning interiors, prime locations, and personalized services. Enjoy complete flexibility when it comes to private offices, co-working, virtual offices, and events. Our team of experts will find what space works for you. The Executive Center. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries.
Christ conquered the only God. But mankind won't be destroyed. The fact that you and I are working here today is evidence of that. Executive Center makes choosing a workspace simple, award-winning interiors, prime locations, and personalized services. Enjoy complete flexibility when it comes to private offices, co-working, virtual offices, and events. Our team of experts will find what space works for you. The Executive Center. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries.
The Executive Center makes choosing a workspace simple, award-winning interiors, prime locations, and personalized services. Enjoy complete flexibility when it comes to private offices, co-working, virtual offices, and events. Our team of experts will find what space works for you. The Executive Center. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. All right, in this next segment, I'm delighted to be speaking with Richard Yu. Richard is Chief Executive Officer and Chief Investment Officer at Arch Capital Management. Richard, thank you for being with Hi, us. Man. And yes. thank you for being an awards jury member. As we enter the 14th edition of the awards, can you share how residential development submissions have evolved? Sure, sure. Time flies. It's our 14th mm -hmm. year. Um, over the years, I think um, all the submissions are very good. Just to kind of recap, our main uh, kind of judging criteria, of course, is uh, design. So the aesthetic is, is very important. And then the project has to blend in very nicely with its neighborhood. Um, and then we go down the list. Over the years, I think we're, we're, we're stressing more and more on uh, environmentally friendly projects and sustainability, the whole ESG. Mm -hmm. So over the years, we're, we're seeing in, increasing focus uh, on that area. And actually, we, we give them a lot of credits if they do a good job on that. So efficiency on uh, energy, water, uh, and the whole carbon, uh, carbon, zero carbon uh, uh, front, that's, uh, that score high marks with us. So it's more than just a, a, a nice building. Mm. Do you think projects are kind of doomed if they don't kind of at least take a step in that ESG direction? Um, uh, actually, if you, if you look at a, a residential project now, you almost expect there's an element of that. Uh, often it's the landscaping, the greenery that surrounds a project. Uh, what is challenging for us is when you have a, a jurisdiction where you can allow to have more horizontal and low density projects competing in jurisdictions like Hong Kong where everything is tall mm. and, and, and dense. 
So you put those projects against each other, it's harder to judge. Yep. So, uh, but yeah, uh, but we, we've been getting very, very good submissions. And, and earlier Francois and Nick uh, has touched upon, uh, uh, we're getting submissions from uh, more and more from other parts of Asia. Initially, a lot of the Resi projects come out of Hong Kong and Singapore. Mm -hmm. Now actually we're, we're seeing a more and more, more well-rounded uh, entry. So, so we're very pleased about that. Are there any other, other mar any markets apart from Hong Kong and Singapore that has caught your eye where you, you expect to see some really exciting stuff come out of? Japan has done, uh, there's been very, very good entries from Japan and China. Okay. Uh, in Southeast Asia, I think India, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, they all have strong entries. So okay. um, yeah. Something to look out for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, as an asset manager, obviously you invest and in, uh, <clears throat> you told me you guys significantly develop residential as mm. well. Looking to the future, you know, COVID-19 has significantly changed our lives. Do you think the design of residential projects will change in light of what's been going on? I, I think that's a very good question. As we live in the middle of COVID, we're, all of us are spending more time at home. Uh, I was actually at the office this morning. We're supposed to work from home this week. Mm. Everyone's at the office. <laughs> I said, like, what are you guys doing here? He said, well, this is home. Yeah. In fact, I mean, people do spend a lot of time working. Um, going forward, I, I do see the, the, all the asset class kind of merging, you know. Um, you're, you're working out of home, you're spending a lot of time at the office, so it's, it's, it's merging. So the design actually will change. For us, I think um, traditionally uh, there's been a trend towards kind of open layouts in the homes, especially in, in, in parts of the world where people actually can afford more space. Yes, yes. But during COVID, the open layout becomes very challenging. For instance, I could be having a Zoom call, a Zoom meeting, my wife could be having a Zoom call, and then my kids have online classes. Yeah. Right? You almost have to go back to you know, where you have to cut up the space for individual functions. So I, I think for residential design, we will see a more specific area designated for different use. Okay. Uh, you know, acoustics, uh, that whole kind of home office uh, uh, functionality will, 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 will merge. So it will be quite interesting. And also I think, as we, we spend more time at home, I think uh, people tend to cook more, mm. they gather more. I think kitchen is an area where people actually spend a lot of time in. So right. I think, you know, a lot of my friends are actually learning how to cook. Yeah. My wife are always looking at cookbooks. So I think, you know, investment in a nice kitchen is something that you, you need to do more. Um, online shopping creates all kinds of logistics issues if you live in a vertical building. Ah. Um, so unless you have a concierge or reception, all these packages that come in every day, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. So a lot of these things will, will, will change, will change over time. I, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot here. Hearing what you have just said, does that mean you think work from home is going to stick around? Um, to a certain extent, I think, uh, well, if, as long as it's safe to go back to work, I think a lot of people will go back to work. But in Asia, where, where um, it's, uh, people live in very small homes, like I said earlier, unless you have a big home, you can have different areas designated for different use. Uh, I found my whole team at, at the office. So I, 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 and earlier, Francois talked about collaboration of ideas. Office is really where people collaborate, they engage, they interact socially, and spark, you know, ideas come. Mm. Uh, I think that will never change. Um, but, you know, I think people will stress more about where they live and how, how, how the living space is, is designed. So. Well, from, from my experience and what I hear from my friends and colleagues, same thing even when they have the option to work from home, here in Hong Kong at least, sometimes and often they choose to go back to the office. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in one of our projects, we're actually making the office more homey. Ah. So that when you're actually going to work, you know, there, there, you know, there are corners and nukes where you can, you can, you know, you feel like you're actually not just at a, you know, glass, you know, coal mm -hmm. kind of office. So. Don't make it too nice, otherwise people <laughs> aren't gonna go home. <laughs> I want to change focus and talk about property prices. Uh, obviously, in Asia, many property markets uh, are, are quite expensive. And, and there's an argument, say, that the young generation has been priced out. Co-living has been viewed as a possible solution to this. And of course, often it caters to the young generation who, who absorb, you know, are able to accept this, this co-living environment. They find it fun. They find it refreshing. Do you share this view? And in your opinion, will the current pandemic affect the growth of this sector? A very good question. Uh, actually, I, I, I would split that question. Rising property prices does create uh, issues, for, especially for the younger generations. 
So the whole uh, co-living definition, actually people define co-living differently. Sure. Um, some people, uh, the general definition for us is just we're providing quality uh, micro service apartments for people. And it, it provides flexibility. So in terms of the, the, the term of the lease and so on, uh, it's flexible. Uh, it's less expensive, but you're also giving them less space. So that's kind of the, our definition of co-living. Now, younger generations, they, they, they tend to like to mingle and, and they like to meet and so on. So generally, these assets would have areas where they, they can share space, like a, a, a nice living room where you don't actually have to have your own living room, but you can share. Sure. A kitchen, a nice kitchen with the, the right, you know, the appliances and nice appliances and so on. During the pandemic, of course, these areas are probably less used. Uh, but the key is you can hide in your own micro space, well furnished with great Wi-Fi, uh, you know, have your own bathroom and so on. So uh, we, we find that actually that's, uh, that's caught on. In fact, we're rolling this uh, business out regionally. We're actually seeing uh, a lot of demand for these type of products all over Asia. I think uh, residential, obviously, near and dear to many people's hearts. So thank you for your sharing, Richard. And we look forward to seeing more <laughs> submissions and what the residential sector is going to do. You, thank Thanks you very much. Yep. Thank you. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. The whole industry is this week in the south of France. MIPIM has always been kind of the vanguard of showing where the future may go. In four days, you probably have 
as many meetings as you would have during three or four months. So this is a business accelerator. We meet with a lot of people. We have opportunity to do leasing, buying, selling, financing. Every year there's something new that I'll discover but there's no place like this uh, to keep the pulse of what's happening on, in the industry. The real attraction is you've got people from all the different elements of the real estate sector, architects, surveyors, developers, investors, and I think it's a great way for that community to come together. Nippon is also always looking at new themes, whether it be prop tech, new business models, the, the evolution of the real estate sector generally. To really talk about where the industry is going, certainly in terms of the property and the, the commercial markets. It's going to be much more about the productivity within spaces, the experience. So we have to transform ourselves into a innovative, technology-based uh, industry. The future has to be with smart cities and places that people actually want to live. You're creating much more value by creating a place that has a synergy, that has the capability of establishing a lifestyle pattern. I don't think this sector will ever do without personal interaction, but tech will become more and more important. The real value of people will be around the interpretation of the data, the preparation and formulation of strategy. Frankly, events like MIPIM, I think, will become more significant because they will be those opportunities to be face-to-face. -face. Business, contacts, friendships. Imagine a world without MIPIM. Our next speaker is George Agathon, Senior Vice President, Asia Pacific of Ivanhoe, Cambridge. Welcome. Hi, Desmond. Now, as a pension fund investor from North America, how are you guys managing your current Asia portfolio of investments under these COVID times, George? Yeah, look, um, Ivanhoe, Cambridge has been in Asia uh, and have had people on the ground for uh, close to 15 years now. So we have a team in Hong Kong, uh, in Shanghai, and in Mumbai uh, covering the region. So to, uh, you know, when COVID hit, and it's about a year now uh, that we've been living under these conditions, um, having people on the ground certainly has made it easier. Uh, we focus very much on people's, uh, our team's health and safety. Uh, so that was pretty important. Uh, we were working from home at different speeds in, in all the different offices. And then obviously working with our partners as well to make sure um, our properties were well managed. So we went into asset management overdrive. Um, ensuring that um, at least our stakeholders uh, were well protected during this time. Um, interestingly, for our organization, we started a work from home program um, about six months before COVID. Mm -hmm. So when COVID hit, um, we were pretty able to scale up the IT backbone uh, mm -hmm. of the platform. Everybody went back, first Zoom meetings, or we use WebEx, first WebEx and Teams meetings, uh, went <clears throat> really smoothly, and then that became our kind of normal course of the um, of, of our business day. Okay. Yeah. I think another one of our speakers earlier might have been Francois who mentioned, you know, uh, 
you have to have people on the ground in order to do real estate. Now, you, you had mentioned that you guys were in the forefront of work from home. Would you agree with that? You, do you have to be kind of on the ground? Would you open more offices in light of this COVID? That, that's a really good question because if, if um, I think in the short term, at least in 2020, uh, we got by, uh, we made, we continue to make investments. Mm -hmm. We obviously paused in the first half of the year because we weren't too sure what was going on. Um, but then as we saw how Asia in particular managed the pandemic slightly better than other places, uh, our confidence levels went up to make further investments. But as traditional real estate practitioners, you know, we, we want to see it, we want to feel it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of our business model depends on, you know, finding the right partners and managers and, you know, people that, that help us in the different cities. So that's been quite difficult. So establishing new relationships have, has been obviously a lot more difficult. Uh, during this period. But in terms of investing, uh, the team, fortunately, um, in different cities, but also from different places, we have a, quite a large number of nationalities that sit here. So when we talk about Sydney or Melbourne or Tokyo or in China, any one of the, most of the cities in China, we have somebody in the team that actually knows the city, knows the building, knows the location. Okay. How do you see inbound investment strategy for Asia changing or evolving in the future as a result of something like COVID? Um, I think, you know, Asia was already on the path of becoming more significant for um, international investors in their global portfolio. Uh, you know, kind of 15, 20 years ago, Asia was probably a more niche component mm -hmm. of a global real estate portfolio. There's been a lot of development. There's a lot of really good product now. And we're seeing Asia really becoming a, a big slice of the pie. So for Ivanhoe, Cambridge, you know, we're kind of about 7% of our global portfolio is in Asia. Seven? Seven, okay. right? That, you know, we're looking to double that uh, in, in this kind of short, medium term. So, so the ambitions are great. COVID has just, I guess, reinforced what we felt were longer term trends, uh, urbanization, the rise of e-commerce, um, and kind of the rising middle class here in Asia. So, so things that we thought were uh, going to be uh, important for our portfolio um, over this next decade, uh, uh, that's been accelerated by COVID in a large extent. Okay. Um, some of our audience, of course, are very familiar with Asia, and I'm guessing some are not as familiar with Asia. Can you share with us some of the key success factors for Ivanhoe Cambridge in the time that you've been here? Uh, sure. Tell the audience about that. Sure. Um, so, you know, the, the typical way that investors from outside of Asia have invested into Asia is through, um, I guess, funds. So finding a manager that has a good track record in, in Asia um, and then investing with them in a more passive sense. So, you know, they invest and the manager does uh, pretty much most of it. So, so then building up kind of comfort and understanding of the markets, the dynamics, and then maybe making a few more kind of more direct investments. But the success factors have always remained uh, that Asia is a very diverse place, very complex place, many different countries. It's a little bit different from Europe in that we don't have a common, uh, I guess, um, uh, uh, region or economic yeah. zone. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the laws are different, tax is different. Um, and so that drives some complexity and, and challenges for investing in the Asian market. So first filter in terms of managing risk, I would say for most of our peers is finding the right partners. Uh, finding the right fiduciary partners, fund managers, developers that you want to work with, uh, that's always been the key success factor before you kind of talk about any kind of real estate projects. Mm -hmm. George, off camera, we had talked a little bit about the submissions for this year and yeah. in recent times. And you had told me that ESG is something that you've noticed is, is uh, very prevalent in changing the region. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, you know, this year again, you know, really super impressed by the quality of submissions around ESG. Um, you know, we have a separate ESG category, obviously, mm -hmm. but, you know, pretty much every project uh, in every category has incorporated this. And over the years, uh, ESG was something that was, um, yep, something that happened in the West, uh, something that maybe, you know, you read about, and then the technology and the people and the talent weren't really in Asia. Uh, that's really, really changed. Now we're seeing sustainability. Um, we're seeing Asia lead that. A lot of developers and investors lead that here. For us, uh, we have a very ambitious target to reduce our carbon 
uh, emissions or carbon footprint in our real estate portfolio. So, you know, from our perspective, how we look to influence the industry is, you know, very soon we will not be making any investments unless those investments mm -hmm. kind of add to our our uh, low carbon portfolio. So, so yeah, something to look out for. Sure. Okay, that was George Agathon from Ivanhoe, Cambridge. Thank you very much for joining us, George. Thank you, Desmond. Really appreciate it. Thank you. The whole industry is this week in the south of France. Nipping has always been kind of the vanguard of showing where the future may go. In four days, you probably have as many meetings as you would have during three or four months. So this is a business accelerator. We meet with a lot of people. We have opportunity to do leasing, buying, selling, financing. Every year there's something new that I'll discover, but there's no place like this uh, to keep the pulse of what's happening on, in the industry. The real attraction is you've got people from all the different elements of the real estate sector, architects, surveyors, developers, investors, and I think it's a great way for that community to come together. Nippon is also always looking at new themes, whether it be prop tech, new business models, the, the evolution of the real estate sector generally. To really talk about where the industry is going, certainly in terms of the property and the, the commercial markets. It's going to be much more about the productivity within spaces, the experience. So we have to transform ourselves into an innovative, technology-based uh, industry. The future has to be with smart cities and places that people actually want to live. You're creating much more value by creating a place that has a synergy, that has the capability of establishing a lifestyle pattern. I don't think this sector will ever do without personal interaction, but tech will become more and more important. The real value of people will be around the interpretation of the data, the preparation and formulation of strategy. Frankly, events like MIPIM, I think, will become more significant because they will be those opportunities to be face-to-face. -face. Business, contacts, friendships. Imagine a world without MIPIM. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries.
The Executive Center makes choosing a workspace simple. Award-winning interiors, prime locations, and personalized services. Enjoy complete flexibility when it comes to private offices, co-working, virtual offices, and events. Our team of experts will find what space works for you. The Executive Center. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. All right, and we're back. Next up, we have with us Chris Chow, Senior Managing Director at LaSalle Investment Management. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Chris, across Asia-Pacific markets, which sectors or regions have been the most resilient during the pandemic, and why do you think they are able to withstand? If you look in, into the, the resiliency, right, it's really about you know, whether, which of those asset types can maintain the cash flow, the income of the property type. And uh, the other thing to look into is that, you know, some of these, these uh, resiliency, some of these stronger sector has been forming pre-COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And what we saw from the pandemic is that, you know, um, the winner is not taking all, but the winner is taking more. Mm -hmm. The way I want to say this is that for a logistic warehouse, for example, it has been an institutional asset class in the last several years. Yep. When it first, into, work, first went into a logistic in Japan and China, for example, one or two decades ago, it wasn't an uh, institutional investment grade asset type for most of the uh, Asian economies. Uh, it has gone into this level of um, you know, institutional grade asset with the uh, pandemic that drive further demand in terms of warehouse mm. in the end user perspective and also institutional investor demand. We see this is uh, not only just resilient, it's continued to be a winner. And the gap we pull from the, um, the loser end of the property type, for example, retail, mm. and then the gap is actually widened a bit more both from the, um, from the occupier, occupier demand standpoint and as well as from the investor standpoint. Mm. So we think that this, this is quite structural. So this is not fully impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, but it is a, um, it's an extension of the, um, of the winning and losing track. We'll see that continue to, um, to, to, um, to display 
mm. in the in a couple of years to come. So, so it seems then what you were saying is COVID has accelerated things. That's right. Mm. It has uh, amplified amplified you know, the, the winner sector and the losing sector. Right. But then, uh, are, are the building. I mean, it takes time to build a logistics warehouse. Even though there's more demand, it seems the trend is going there. Uh, are developers able to do that? Because all of a sudden there's more demand, but do, can they catch up with that demand? Um, good question. I think the, the beauty of uh, logistics in many markets is that you know, it has less development risk uh, in, in, inherent into those, because we're not you know, building a high wide building like the office building. Mm. Although in some markets like Hong Kong, Japan, that we have multi-story warehouses, but for, for other markets such as China, we are still doing uh, one or two story warehouse. We, we may be doing three, three story warehouse pretty soon, mm -hmm. but then those are a bit easier in terms of construction, uh, but they have also come into our, our type of uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, land acquisition could be a challenge for a lot of new, new entrants of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been operating in this space, our, our China team, our Japan uh, in this space for uh, over a decade. So they have good, um, access to land acquisition. I think that's the uh, the key in terms of uh, developing providing supply into this space. Mm. Uh, which markets, either in Asia or around the world, do you think will come out better uh, or stronger as a re result of COVID-19? Uh, I tend to, think, tend to think that COVID-19 is very impactful. You know, the impact is very deep, but could be somewhat temporary. So I think the snapshot that we see today maybe is all linked to how different regions and countries respond to the, the pandemic happened so far. And then maybe going forward and how effective in terms of, in, uh, in terms of uh, getting the people uh, have, have access to the vaccines. So it's really about how much those impact become long-term structural change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now we see pretty good um, you know, uh, containment of the uh, pandemic in China or Korea, mm. uh, hopefully they'll continue, mm. but it's still yet to be seen uh, who, who will eventually uh, continue to do well in terms of containing that pandemic in the respective mm. country. Um, one of the most mature and deepest markets here in Asia Pacific, of course, is Japan. Tell us how Japan real estate has weathered the pandemic. And also, could you tell us a little bit about current investors' appetite for that market? Um, well, first of all, you know, we look in. We have operation in the whole of Asia. You know, we have uh, six major destinations that we invest. Um, you know, when um, Francois and the other speaker also mentioned uh, George just now, talking about we need to have people on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, including Japan market, which we, is one of the biggest office in Asia Pacific operation. That's also important for for people like us to have to have uh, you know, acquisition asset management people on the ground to execute all these strategy. That's particularly important for COVID nineteen when we have investors or, uh, you know, who cannot really uh, come to the country, right, for, for, to, to deploy the investment. So having people on the ground to do it for them is very critical. Um, and, and Asia is so, so different in terms of, you know, different cultural and geographic differences. Um, I think the difference in responding to the pandemic will, will make it even more difficult to under it correctly. So we, we, we have, um, you know, uh, we have used our team basically to do uh, the whole integration from acquisition all the way to uh, asset management. Japan is our one of the biggest, biggest market. We are investing in all sector types mm -hmm. over there. Um, we have different type of strategy from um, you know, core to opportunistic. I was saying that um, you know, because of the, um, the low interest rate environment in Japan, and it will continue to be, to be the case, it's the right, one of the lowest in, across the Asia Pacific mm -hmm. region. So the spread that we use in terms of uh, describing the, uh, the income that you're getting or the returns you're getting from, um, from Japan market compared to the risk free rate is still very healthy. Mm -hmm. So then this is market, con market continue to um, not only attract uh, foreign investors, it has been for last many years. I think the, uh, you know, when I talk to my Japanese colleague, you know, they also see a good flow of J Japanese domestic investor. This will not only, um, you know, they will not only help us in terms of deployment, but will also continue to, um, to sustain um, uh, the growth in the rest of the investment market in Japan. Now, regardless of sector, whether it be residential or logistics or retail mall, a lot of these projects were started in a pre-COVID world. Mm -hmm. Now that COVID has come along, do you think any of these projects might run the risk of being irrelevant or how can they adapt to make sure that they stay relevant in a post-COVID world? Very good, good point. 
depends on which asset type as well. You know, when, when we are developing warehouses, I think the demand is still strong mm -hmm. from the uh, occupying standpoint. Mm -hmm. And from the end user standpoint, you know, the, um, you know they, they are also serving the end user in a very in a growth environment. So I think those are okay. Of course, if you are, you know, if you are delivering uh, hospitality, mm -hmm. uh, you will have the different types of uh, you know income uh, in terms of timing. It may come in later than you expected. Mm -hmm. So uh, some of the other players they may do uh, retail development. They may have to make some changes in terms of how to cope with the shift. Uh, the greatest shift into uh, e-commerce versus traditional retail. Uh, just in some, some locations, right, the, the traditional retail really becomes an, uh, an offline, off online showroom type yep. of uh, partnership. Yep. So I think people can make shift and changes to, to respond um, what pandemic has brought to them. Mm -hmm. Some may just a bit of time, due to, for example, hospitality and lodging. Uh, they just need to have those uh, visitors, domestic or overseas to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, some just have to have to change in terms of the way they um, they, they design, they build uh, retail. My last question for you, Chris. I want to bring it back to the awards. Um, if you compare the submissions from years past mm -hmm. to uh, more recent years, are you seeing any kind of big changes in terms of trends, quality of submissions, the kind of projects that get submitted? Um, I would say that you know the for each of the category, we are seeing some differences in terms of how they how they approach you know let's say for retail you know we have a very um, we have a couple of interesting projects one from uh, Japan mm -hmm. uh, is an, is the old building they preserved you know the original facade mm -hmm. of the building but then they they modernize you know the inside which actually have a very good draw because people are coming in for experience nowadays for for retail uh, if you look at the one of the uh, um, you know uh, award the, the K11 you know when you walk inside you you don't feel the same type of uh, retail oh. uh, environment. Yeah. Um, it's much softer. I feel a bit like home. So we, we feel that these winners, they're able to, to uh, dis distinguish themselves mm -hmm. by leveraging the existing situation, like the one that, you know, in Japan, mm -hmm. or basically or, or the one in K11 that give you a complete new experience yeah. on how to, um, to give um, the, um, the shoppers uh, new experience when they come over there. Okay. Chris Chow, always a pleasure. Thank you for your sharing. Thank you so much. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries.
The Executive Center makes choosing a workspace simple, award-winning interiors, prime locations, and personalized services. Enjoy complete flexibility when it comes to private offices, co-working, virtual offices, and events. Our team of experts will find what space works for you. The Executive Center. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. Our next interview will be conducted by Francis Lee, International Director, Vice President, Greater China, Head of Capital Markets, Greater China at Cushman and Wakefield. I will now invite him on stage and he will introduce his guest. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Justin Chiu. He's a member of the uh, com uh, Management Committee of an Executive Director of Chiang Kong Group. Uh, Justin has been uh, in the industry for 40 years plus, yeah. and uh, he's been in Hong Kong and various countries. He also the um, a fellow member of the Royal Institution of Charles Xavier, and also the, the um, honourable um, board member of the uh, British uh, Hong Kong Bishop College uh, University of uh, Hong Kong. And uh, yeah. Justin holds a, a, art, a bachelor degree of arts in sociology and economics. Mm -hmm. And also, he's uh, conferred uh, two doctor degrees, <laughs> one from uh, uh, Hong Kong and one from uh, Tran University of, of uh, Canada. Uh, Canada. Mm -hmm. So the, this is uh, Dr. Chiu. Um, May, uh, Marina Bay Financial Center is the, the winner, the gold, gold winner of the best, best mixed use project in Asia and uh, in, back in the Asia 2010, and also the, the, uh, the people's Choice Award. Uh, it's a very interesting um, and also one of the best projects in Asia. And uh, can you share with us, because you have three partners yeah. in this project, yeah. including Chiang Kong Holdings mm -hmm. and Hong Kong Land mm -hmm. and also Capital Land from Singapore. So we have three partners mm -hmm. from Hong Kong, UK and Singapore. How do you manage uh, the three work together in this uh, very big scale? makes the use of project in, in Singapore. Yeah, uh, thank you, Francis. Uh, 
Uh, actually, the Marinda Bay Financial Center is one of the biggest or uh, largest project development projects in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And um, well, it houses more than 4 million square feet. Wow. You see. Uh, at that time, though, when the three of us came together, actually, we had a joint venture before that. That was in the Van Raffles Key, OQ. Mm -hmm. also, also in the Marina Bay area, that was our first project. So, uh, we shared uh, a very good vision, common vision, that, that we want to build the future of Singapore. So that's why when we first started uh, on the Marina Bay Financial Centre, we share the common vision that uh, we will have the workspace in the future. Mm. Uh, we also need to develop a future community, a community in the future, and also let people experience experience of the future. That is very important. So we three of the three partners share the common vision, and that is why you know, we can get along very well you know, in the past. I would say more than 15 years now on this project. Because right now we are still managing the project ourselves. We have the uh, Ruffles Key manage Asset Management Company, which is also a joint venture between the three companies. Mm. So we are still managing, and we want the occupants there to, to really experience the uh, future of Singapore. Well, uh, definitely, uh, we, the three companies come from the three different cultural backgrounds. Now we are from Hong Kong, yep. and uh, Hong Kong then is Hong Kong, but they are more, more or less in Singapore, they call them Amor. Amor, Amor means European or you know, foreigners or white people. Mm. And then the, um, in Singapore, we have capital land. So we have slightly different cultural background. But I think for any joint venture partnership, the most important thing is you share the same vision, as I said just now. And then we have the mutual respect. Mm. You need to respect your partners so that the, uh, because every party has their own contributions mm. to the joint venture to the success of the joint venture. So you need to respect them, respect the idea, uh, respect how they look at things, and then we can discuss. Definitely, it's not 100% we agree on everything. Mm. There are always problems or small uh, disagreements that come up, you know, that, but we, need, we can sit down and then discuss because we have to show our respect to the other people's uh, contributions and their views. And then we also need to have the um, Mutual trust. I think that is important mm. because for any joint venture partner, if you don't share the mutual trust, that there's no way for the partnership to continue. You, you, you have hard feelings from time to time and you may become suspicious, so to speak, on your partners, whether why they don't want to do this, do they have any selfish interests. But in our joint venture partnership, three of us you know, we never have any suspicion over any others. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, f uh, on in the construction side, we comfortably leave it to Capital Land yeah. because they know Singapore very well. Right? Uh, we are from Hong Kong. We cannot claim we know Singapore regulations, uh, we know Singapore authorities. No, but in Capital Land, they know them very well. So we comfortably uh, uh, give the duties to, to Hong Kong Land and then for some, in some of the technical issues, we respect the, um, the experience of Hong Kong land. Mm. So that's why uh, in some of the design, for example, then you know, we really respect uh, Hong Kong land's contributions and their suggestions. Uh, that is why you know, in, in facing out the MBS, MBFC, uh, we have the residential first and then the commercial blocks and then also the um, another residential part component. Uh, before we finish the retail portion. Mm. So that's why on all these phases, the three partners sit down together and discuss together, and then we share the common vision that you know, we want to build the future of the community. I think that is important. So the, in the foreseeable future, do you see, do you see that uh, the three parties or the three partners will come together again to do another project? Oh, definitely. Uh, actually, uh, after the MBFC project, so we came together and tended for another project in Singapore, no? but uh, we were not successful no? uh, well, because other people offer a higher price for it. Uh, but definitely in future, no, we will find ways that, so that we can work together again. You see. Uh, MBFC is one of the most successful joint venture secret group has. You see. Mm. And also I heard also from Hong Kong and Capital Land. Because that was a success, uh, that is a successful project, and we we all make a lot of money. You see, we are happy with it.
So apart from Singapore, do you think uh, the three partners would say, come to another country and cities to take mm. another mega project well, in Asia? It depends on opportunities, you see. Because right now, I think the composition is good uh, because uh, we have a very good uh, local partner, the Capital Land. And Hong Kong Land also knows Singapore very well. Mm -hmm. And for the CK Group, we have been in Singapore for more, more, more than 30 years. So we also know a bit of Singapore. That's why we can share uh, common knowledge and we can share common vision on the future of Singapore. But if you go to another place like, uh, for example, Cambodia, which is very hot right now, mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think we also we might also need to look for another local partner mm -hmm. before we can really follow the joint venture partnership. But whether the new partnership, so to speak, can work, then it really depends on whether we, at that time, if we can share also the same vision, uh, same mutual respect, and also the same mutual trust. Yeah. And uh, I have uh, another question, mm -hmm. purposely, uh, asked uh, by Christine, who asked me, uh, given the current situation in, in Hong Kong, a global under the pandemic, what's the best investment opportunity available to us, especially for us in Hong Kong? Well, definitely, you know, if you're talking about Hong Kong, you know, I, uh, I would advise you, don't only look at Hong Kong. You see. Mm -hmm. In Hong Kong, uh, uh, in, 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 within the CK group, uh, we don't really uh, look at it as Hong Kong anymore. We look at the Greater Bay Area mm -hmm. because the nine plus two, this is a Greater Bay Area. It's a it's, well, we, it's a very uh, important economic momentum. In future, I think in the next twenty years ago, year or so, this will be become one of the world's center of attraction. Mm -hmm. uh, people should go. So, if you want to uh, invest now, I would recommend you go to. The Greater Bay Area. Mm. Personally, I would say personally, I would prefer the uh, western part of the Greater Bay Area, like Zhuhai, Zhaoxing, and you know, and all, and Chongshan, uh, because it's less developed. Okay. Uh, on the uh, western part is very developed, uh, and the eastern part, Zhuhai, Chongshan, and Zhaoxing, is uh, less developed. But I think they are coming up. Okay. Very good advice. Yeah. And, uh, because of the western part of Chu, the Pearl River Delta, I think is uh, still under under development. Uh, actually, uh, you know, we don't talk about the Pearl River Delta anymore. Yeah. It's always Greater Great Bay, Bay Area. area. That is important. GBA, I mean, the, the whole concept needs to change. It's yeah. a Greater Bay Area, yeah. nine plus two cities. You see, yeah. So, so I will I will concentrate on the uh, uh, opportunities in Chongshan, Zhuhai, Zhaoxing, and all that because they are right right now they are less developed. But I think they were coming up. Yeah. So apart from uh, Hong Kong and GBA, how about the rest of Asia? Any, any uh, advice for us? Mm, well, the rest of Asia really depends on the, uh, how far they can control the pandemic situation. Right now, I think Singapore is they have controlled it very well. So Singapore will be one of the first countries mm. that, that will come back. But in some other countries, you know, they are still facing difficulties. Uh, once you have the social distance, once, once, once you have all these um, uh, control measures in place, then it's difficult for the economy to develop. And uh, that will practically kill all economic activities. Mm. So you did mention about the opportunity in Southeast Asia. Uh, mm. Do you think uh, your group will invest down south? Uh, well, depends on opportunities. If mm. there's good opportunities coming up, why not? Let's see. I think there's... Well, as a, as a big group you know, like ours, you know, we only go for opportunities. So yeah. Whenever there is opportunities, we'll just go ahead. You know, we don't confine ourselves to any geographical location, or we don't confine ourselves to any countries as such. You, see. you look for opportunities. Yeah, that's a very good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Follow the opportunity, right? Rather than fix your destination. Uh, because the, the, the world is changing fast, you see. Yep. There are opportunities coming up every now and then, any, any place, anywhere. So that's why we, you have to be on your toes all the time, you know, try to search for opportunities and try to pick up more context. Right now, due to the pandemic situation, we cannot travel, but we can still do it by Zoom. Zoom mm. meetings, that's mm. not what, what we are doing today. You know. Technology has overcome part of the problem that yeah. we, can, we cannot meet face to face. But definitely, uh, business shall carry on. Yep, you're perfectly right about that. And thank you very much, Dr. Mm. Chiu. And, then, uh, and thank you very much for, for your participation to this uh, interview, which is a very, very good uh, 
for, for you to catch up with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. The whole industry is this week in the south of France. MIPIM has always been kind of the vanguard of showing where the future may go. In four days, you probably have as many meetings as you would have during three or four months. So this is a business accelerator. We meet with a lot of people. We have opportunity to do leasing, buying, selling, financing. Every year there's something new that I'll discover but there's no place like this uh, to keep the pulse of what's happening on, in the industry. The real attraction is you've got people from all the different elements of the real estate sector, architects, surveyors, developers, investors, and I think it's a great way for that community to come together. MIPIM is also always looking at new themes, whether it be prop tech, new business models, uh, the evolution of the real estate sector generally. To really talk about where the industry is going, certainly in terms of the property and the, the commercial markets. It's going to be much more about the productivity within spaces, the experience. So we have to transform ourselves into an innovative, technology-based uh, industry. The future has to be with smart cities and places that people actually want to live. You're creating much more value by creating a place that has a synergy, that has the capability of establishing a lifestyle pattern. I don't think this sector will ever do without personal interaction, but tech will become more and more important. The real value of people will be around the interpretation of the data, the preparation and formulation of strategy. Frankly, events like MIPIM, I think, will become more significant because they will be those opportunities to be face-to-face. -face. Business, contacts, friendships. Imagine a world without MIPIM. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. For our ninth and final interview, we're delighted to have with us Ellen M, head of China real estate at Warburg Pincus Asia LLC. Ellen, Warburg Pincus has been actively investing globally in what we now call new economy investments. This is also a new category that we created for MIPIM Asia Awards in 2020. Mm -hmm. What are the new economy investments that you feel have the most potential in China? Right. Um, to frame this a little bit, you know, new economy, by that we refer to all the infrastructure plays, logistics, data centers, um, technology and biotech parks. Mm -hmm. and you can even loop in sort of for rental apartments, uh, multifamily into mm -hmm. that category, okay. given how nascent that segment is in, in the context of China across the region. Um, you know, today that makes up roughly three quarters of our entire portfolio. So we've been very much, wow. um, you know, skewed towards uh, those those favorite asset classes. Okay. Now, as an institutional investor, 
What have been some of the challenges that you, you have faced this year, and how do you overcome those challenges? Um, obviously, the last this year, the past 12 months have been um, exceptional. Um, I think it, it happens in different phases in the initial uh, quarters of the outbreak in, in the context of China, Q1, Q2 last year. Uh, obviously, the, the key challenge was making sure the banking relationships and people were initially shocked by the disruption, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in, in real estate, you can get the area that you could get, um, you could suffer is if you have too much leverage. So across the portfolio, fortunately, we're very moderately uh, leveraged, but mm -hmm. there's still, when there are disruptions to the operations in some of our businesses that required uh, conversations with banks. Um, and But very, very quickly, uh, uh, we had, most of our business have gone back to normalized levels. Um, you know, our most hit business was actually a car park company in China. Mm -hmm. uh, at the peak of the pandemic, it was at 20% of utilization. Mm. Uh, by mid last year, it's already been back to pre-COVID levels. So it's quite short duration. Um, and then closer to end of last year, I think overall, uh, the, the challenge was, you know, physically, we can't always be on the ground. Mm. So in terms of grooming new relationships and operating partners, uh, it took more innovative, different ways of uh, working uh, with new partners, particularly. Uh, that said, most of our team is also on the ground in China. So that had helped um, you know, manage some of these relationships. Now, because your business is in China, China has done a pretty good job in controlling COVID compared mm -hmm. with the rest of the world. That has obviously worked in your favor. Do you see that continuing or, or compared with the rest of the world and, and as other markets deal with COVID and its implications? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, so we are obviously a very interconnected world and our clients, our LP uh, capital partners are all, all globally. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, in terms of deployment of capital and the fundamentals uh, of what we have invested in, obviously we're, we're a bit fortunate in that this has, the China economy has uh, gone back, back to relatively normalized levels sooner, right? But we expect sort of waves and, and you know, surprises. I think we're now as, as having a bigger appetite for surprises. Sure. But, the, you know, by and large, I think the fundamentals have been very robust. And if anything, the um, pandemic last year has shown the resilience and the acceleration of some of the growth areas that we are very much focused on in these new economy sectors. Mm. Do you think investment strategies uh, will change or evolve as a, as a result of COVID, both in China and in other parts of the region? And what will those changes look like? Um, again, I think the way we've positioned our portfolio, it was not you know, preparing for the COVID. It was you know, some of these themes, in our view, are long-term, what we call decade durable secular trends. Mm. Um, for example, we've been playing logistics for 10 years now. Uh, in China, and when we started, it was, you know, online shopping penetration was 2%, now it's 25% of all shopping levels. Wow. So that has, um, that has clearly been a good journey. But even today, with uh, impact of COVID, there's some acceleration, we are still very underserved and underbuilt uh, in terms of logistics infrastructure compared to development levels, right? Mm -hmm. If you count all the modern logistics in China, there's more uh, modern warehouses in the state of California than the entirety of the country. Mm -hmm. So even with a pretty long run of capital interest, a lot more development, because of the sheer scale of the demand uh, in a country like China, and that today, the most of the developers are still focused on for sale um, residential, right? Mm -hmm. So in some of these newer, uh, new economy sectors, we're seeing you know very robust demand uh, versus um, you know, insufficient supply. And the same goes uh, to other asset classes like data centers where you have probably six, seven times that the internet population in across Asia compared to developed markets, but one, one tenth of the capacity. Um, so, you know, we see with, with or without the impact of COVID, these are gonna be play out over the next 10 years, if not more. So you're excited about logistics, excited about data centers. Are mm -hmm. there cities in China that you are particularly Excited about where uh, you think this could be? This could be the next big thing. Uh, you know, for a lot of these sectors, they are national wide, right? Obviously, the inf in terms of infrastructure serving, um, uh, internet usage serving, you know, fulfillment needs of e-commerce players 
Uh, these, they are naturally surrounded in major cities, with the more populated cities. But we're seeing sort of new drivers of growth within these uh, bigger food groups, right? Within logistics, is emerged from a niche sector into a much bigger food group. And there are now new drivers like grocery deliveries, right, which generates new uh, fulfillment infrastructure in across the country, not just the big cities. So there aren't sort of one city or a couple of cities that stand out per se. I think these are trends that are applicable to the broader population across many markets. Okay. For my final question for you, I also want to bring it back to the awards. Mm -hmm. uh, as a jury member for a few years now, uh, was there a, a project this year uh, that you found especially exciting, that, that you, you felt like this is something that is very special or different from ones you've seen in the past? Um, I think from my standpoint, we're very glad to see some of our projects that are managed by our operating partners were uh, made, made you know, some of the, won some of the awards, be it ESR winning the, you know, uh, the Green Award, uh, as well as the new, new whole category around infrastructure um, and, and the asset classes. I think that has been a big progress. Um, and other sectors like even traditional office buildings, some of our portfolio projects have uh, made it to the best green buildings. So those, those are very special um, personally to us. Um, in general, I think the, as some of our earlier speakers have shared, the caliber of um, some of the mixed-use projects have been quite special, not only in new development, but in the regeneration projects, mm -hmm. right? So it also represents a shift from just building you know, big elephant projects yeah. uh, to more operational intensive and paying more attention to sustainability um, and better uses of uh, resources, be it land or just, just um, you know, better, better uses of space. Okay, thank you very much for talking with thank us. Thank you for having me. Ellen Wu, Warburg Pincus, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Ellen. Well, that concludes our conversations with the experts. At this time, I'd like to welcome back Christine Lam, Asia Pacific Regional Director at Reed Midham, who will share some final thoughts with us. Christine, hello again. Uh, thank you to everybody for having joined us for, thank you for, thank you everyone for having joined us for the speaker program as well as all of our speakers. Uh, clearly the real estate industry has laggard behind in technology compared to other industries, uh, Asia especially, so we hope to be able to bring new life to technology. So since 2016, we at Reed Medium has launched the startup competition which brings uh, new innovation ideas to the industry. So uh, please join us for the startup competition, which will begin shortly. Thank, Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'd like to introduce the Propel by MIPM startup competition conducted in partnership with real estate tech company Metaprop NYC to reveal the most promising and innovative projects. Now, as a little background for those of you who may not have been following the competition, we had our first stop in Paris, the second stop was in New York, and the third and final stop is here in Hong Kong before we move to the grand finale in Cannes. At this time, let's learn more.
Okay, thank you, Christine, and welcome everyone to the third semifinal stop on the Global Startup Competition. We hope you have enjoyed the previous stops on the competition in Paris in 2020, in New York in the fall of 2020, and now in Hong Kong in early 2021. Semifinalist winners from these semifinal stops will be competing for the grand championship in the big room on the main stage, if all goes well, in Cannes, France, during the MIPIM Global event in March. We're very excited for the hundreds of applications received from around the world of innovative prop tech companies and for everybody's submission, preparation, and the world is excited to see these final eight startups here today. My name is Aaron Block. I am the managing partner and co-founder of Metaprop. We are the early stage prop tech investors based in New York City. And I'm very, very pleased to be joined by several esteemed judges. We have Akina from Great Eagle Group. Welcome, Akina. We have Antonio from King Y Group. Welcome, Antonio. We have Andrew from Sino Group. Welcome, Andrew. And we have Eric from our global partner, Union Invest. Great to see all of you again. And very, very happy to have you judging these exciting startups that are coming to present to us in just a moment. In the meantime, some reminders about ground rules. Of course, we will have eight individual presentations across four individual subtopics data startup, investment startup, sustainability startup, and user experience startup. Each startup will have three minutes to present their um, startup information and presentation. Then they will have three minutes to be grilled by this wonderful panel of judges. It is not a lot of time, of course, so we will be succinct. Our good friend Guillaume from Read Midem and from Propel will be keeping us on time. So he will be jumping in, reminding people that it's time to move on. And I will introduce all of the startups. Hopefully the judges will have a chance to be able to understand the startup's presentation, their business, their team, their traction, and their product's capability to transform the real estate industry globally. Without further ado, I would like to kick off the 2020, 2021 final stop in the semifinalist startup competition for Propel by MIPIM by introducing our first startup in the data startup pitch category, ILO. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Hello everyone, my name is Vic, uh, CEO and co-founder from Aero. Aero is a startup doing a natural language understanding SaaS platform for the service apartment uh, and the service industry hospitality. So why I want to start a project with and the service industry, it back to my uh, two years before, uh, before I started the company, I was working for Google for five years uh, in the Mountain View and Taiwan and China. So we do a lot of a consumer voice assistant. However, we find out a lot of in the service industry, they want to implement a consumer product into their service. However, it get broken off in the user experience. That's why we start a company. We want to do the voice SaaS and the natural language understanding data platform for the hospitality, for the service apartment for business, or even like in the well-being service. So uh, in overall, we provided our natural language understanding SaaS platform to support and the, the easy things from the wireless IoT voice control for your, your home or your, your space. And then we want to also using our uh, NLU service to provide a better smart service in your service uh, space. And the most important things and uh, all, everything goes through our voice assistant and the natural language platform. It get a collect a massive of a data for the owner to understand what happened inside their service, inside their room. So uh, in a simple way, we try to put our NLU SaaS platform on top of the property management system, ERP and the BIM to open all the different consumer interface, including an online concierge management platform, or even we have a homemade voice assistant speaker inside the room. And we provide the most valuable things is for 
the owner will be able to understand what happening inside their facility with a backend platform, backend portal to real time to understand what happening inside and how, what is their guest preference. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, the 20 engineers right now and the most come from Qualcomm, Google and MediaTek. We have our own technology to do the graphic DB and the uh, machine learning, natural language understanding, try to understand all the uh, experience and all the, all the domain knowledge from the service, of service industry. So from here, you can see that like, we have a couple of hotels install our solution. And each hotel has the same room pricing, but actually the user profile and the behavior are very different. So even the COVID-19, two years right now, we have Marion Intercontinental and a lot, of, a lot of tier one hotel already deploy our solution. And we have 20 plus inquiry per night in the home and more than 10,000 voice data coming. So here's a quick demo I want to show everyone. So we make a device by ourselves and also we have an English, Japanese and uh, uh, Mandarin support across Southeast Asia and with our backend platform for your guests to understand, for your operator to understand what is going on. So you can see that like, uh, uh, for your guests, they may come from a different space, but they can all use that in your same system, same platform. You have 10 seconds to conclude, thank you. Okay, so in the end, I thank everyone to be able to listen to my presentation and I'm looking for expand into the more service industry uh, with our technology and the Southeast Asia Business Network. Thank you, everyone. Excellent, Vic. Well done, thank you very much. We will now have precisely three minutes for the judges to ask questions. Um, if judges, you can put on your videos and come off mute, please, for this. I think we'll start uh, in alphabetical order. Akina, have you any questions? Yes, I do. Uh, do. Have you done the cost analysis? Because you said you create the device yourself, right? There is a lot of cost for shipping, manufacturing, and also taxation when you ship across country. Why don't you just use based on the existing iOS platform or the Android platform? So you eliminate that cost and just focus on the SaaS model. Yeah, uh, thanks for your question. We actually started a little bit and in the very beginning, we tried to integrate our SaaS software into the device which hotel already using. But however, the problem we find out the different hotel they're using a very, very different device. And even we try to reach out the device manufacturer, they may not, may not be able to really support us to do a high level integration. And for our course, actually right now we're doing leasing model and then the minimal contracts for the uh, three years. And after six months, we actually get our highway cost back. Well, I'm just telling you from my experience, I shipped uh, close to a thousand phones across the world for one of the startup I was in. And what actually um, got us is the devices that the yes. taxations and then everything, that's the, the finally almost killed us, right? So I'm Thank just giving you, you, having a proprietary device will kill you. Okay, thank you, Akina, for your question and for your thoughts. Andrew. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, uh, thank you for that presentation. How do you deal with, like, uh, you know, if, if somebody makes English with, with, with Mandarin, like in Hong Kong's context, you see people <laughs> mixing languages. So how do you deal with that? Uh, can you, can your platform deal okay. with that issue? Okay, yeah. So uh, basically, uh, we know a lot of people they're doing it in the half half like that. English Mandarin or English Cantonese. But by this, actually we're using, and so we're using the ASR from the Google, which is and the, for the uh, speech to text. We do our own natural language understanding, but we actually doing a lot of attacking by understanding what users say. And even say, they, sometimes they say, I want to go to a Starbucks and only Starbucks in English, but others were all in the Mandarin. So we can do a lot of the data tagging to, to predict what kind of a world they were usually instead using in the natural language, but also in using in the foreign language. So we actually do a lot of these things happen, especially in Taiwan and in Singapore. Thank you. Antonio, have you a question for you? Hi. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. It's amazing. And uh, I see that you can collect a lot of data from the information and the service that you provide, but what I think what you can provide more is what you can, how you can make use of the data that you collected. Like if everyone asks for coffee, then maybe the hotel needs to, you know, provide coffee. Or I'm thinking how how do you go beyond what you're already doing. 
Yeah, okay. Thank you. So there's a, the two answers. One answer, for example, you, you bring a good question, not coffee like a Coke. You want ice Coke or ice with, with uh, Coke with ice, that's a different. But we actually learn a lot of this kind of uh, language, the knowledge from all the 20 hotel we have before you. And second thing, uh, uh, beyond the data, actually, for example, we have uh, one hotel. A lot of people asking about, uh, I love your shampoo. Can I buy it or where I can buy it? Then we share the data with the owner. Owner find out, say, oh, okay, actually, I can share the shampoo inside the room or inside my device with a display. So they're using my display become an advertisement channel help, help them to increase the revenue. So also one of the example, like the one hotel, a lot of foreigners, they come, in, they come back to hotel around 4 p.m. They say, where I can find the clothes bar. Then I, we share with the owner or the owner, they actually in the downstairs, they just rent a space to open a bar. So we are not trying to, the first thing is we want to under, help them to understand their, their guests. Then second thing is they go to understand what else they can sell more than B&B. Thank you. And time for the last question, Eric. Thank you. Now, just wondering in terms of the, the back end, apart from all the uh, the technical aspects of, uh, you know, how you actually do the processing, do you actually have any input from, say, you know, it's sort of a follow on from Antonio's question, like psychologists or, you know, is there sort of a human element to to that analysis behind uh, behind the scenes? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So uh, that's just a, the amazing of NLU. So if you're doing an NLU, people will talk in the natural language. So from how they say that, for example, if they say, uh, I want to check Tesla, or they say, oh, maybe Tesla, then you figure out what is the emotional label they want to look into a Tesla. So we try to do a little bit analysis on how people say it. And the second thing is the most important. If people buy Google Home, they know what's a Google Home. They, they do the, the setups for the label, the name, the label. But my guess, 99%, they are working guests. They never use a speaker. This is their anti-first life first time speaker. So they're using a lot of very, very natural way to talk to, to my device. They even say, could you turn off the light which is standing next to the door? So we try to learn these things. That's why we create a graphic DB to help in every hotel because even the biggest hotel around the 1,000 room, they will not be able to train their data. But we cross the horizontals, uh, horizontals, everyone's data, try to help them to understand their guests more by leverage other people's data together. Great, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Vic, and congratulations on your successes. It's time to move on to the second data startup pitch, and that is today, Tower 360. You have three minutes. Uh, Julian, uh, best of luck. Okay, I think you are mute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you, Julian. And you, do you see the screen as well? Perfect. Perfect. So sorry for that. So um, Tower G60, our mission is to help real estate owners fix their, do their data and workflow issues. And so basically what we do, there are two things, is help to connect to uh, the legacy systems in place that are hard to access and typically. And then we also do uh, help real estate owners to digitize their core workflows using no-code enterprise apps. So I'm going to show you the former data management and later workflows in the following slide. So data is hard to access because it resides in some legacy systems on the left or some, um, some, some spreadsheets. So what we have done at Tower360 is basically built an, uh, an aggregation module that can the, the data uh, teams at, the, at our clients can use to build specific data type pipelines using pre-built transformation rules. And uh, basically what you can then do is take the data out of a source system, such as an, ex an MRI by basically here, and transform that um, using the, the, the data transformation rules, and then have a nicely looking uh, database that gets organized and using data um, APIs. So we have pre-built standard APIs. You'll be able to share that data to Tower360 or external applications. And so the second thing we're doing is we, is we also like uh, no code applications that transform different apps and digitize them, different workflows. And I'm going to sh show you a couple of examples. So for example, here statistics for uh, an object around lease expiry, space distribution. Um, those are all examples 
that can be ex extended to the specific requirements of the client. But there are also specific workflows, such as proposal modeling. Um, so here, with a couple of um, templates that get uh, inputs, it's possible to generate um, you know, uh, an, uh, an approval, uh, a, a document that can be shared, um, such, as, such as this. This is a PDF that can be downloaded and shared inside or external to the company. Um, we also de uh, developing more complex contractual documents that can be uh, modeling like uh, the leases for as every asset class around office, industrial, residential, et cetera. And our, our application also have a settings app. So the low code uh, apps can be configured by the client without having to use any external help. So we basically having apps and without the help of any software provider, you can basically configure those applications. In terms of traction, so since our inception in 2017, we have now um, over 100 billion on the platform. Those are EVMs of large real estate owners based in Europe. Um, and furthermore, we have a, a very experienced team, um, also of tech people that have worked at, blue, worked at blue chip companies such as Amazon, Nutanix, or Google. And, and all in all, this puts us in a very good position to build an industry defining company and a new vertical and enterprise software for real estate companies. And we have an office in Shenzhen as well opening. So we are we're planning to expand to Asia uh, Pacific as well. Excellent. Thank you, Julian. And for the three minutes of Q&A, we'll go in opposite order this time. Uh, we'll start if the judges can turn on their microphones and cameras. We'll start with Eric. Thank you. Uh, you probably had the question before. It's usually the garbage in, garbage out sort of uh, analogy. Uh, that aggregation of uh, latent systems or old systems, legacy systems, uh, um, how much sort of like cleanup can you like, do you have to, can you do uh, with your software and how much can needs to actually still be done on top of that by yeah. the client? So there are two setups, right? Like a company like Union Investment will be uh, working with external data providers and getting the data from an operating partner sitting in the US or in Hong Kong, for example and they will have their own system. So the, the typical way we, we work with, with our clients is help to get access to the source system and then upload the data. And there are a lot of uh, transformation rules that can be done. So for example, an asset at the operating partner level will have a different UID than the Union Investment UID. And, um, and so you'd be able to enrich the data using some pre-built logic in our tool. And it's like uh, you know, using Excel and having some, um, some, 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 some logics that you have built. So we can do everything and, and get to the target data model of the landlord. I'd be happy to show you that in a separate demo as well. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Next question from Antonio. Hi, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I saw the, the way that you addressed uh, the problem of uh, data migration. And uh, I see you have offices all around the world. How, you, how, how do you fix the problem with you know, the great firewall of China and all that? Yeah, um, so great firewall of China. So we're not yet in China in terms of having clients there, but we, we our application is completely built. Um, you know, it's it's completely built and can be deployed on any um, any hosting platform, be it Microsoft, Alibaba Cloud, or uh, you know, um, the Ping An Cloud. So so basically, we independent from any tech out there uh, that 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 can be deployed on a, on a local server as well. So so this shouldn't be any problem with with a great firewall at the end. Andrew, uh, question to you. Um, so in, in terms of the, um, how do you cut across different database system and cutting across different suppliers? I guess that, that will remain one of the issue that we often see when somebody's integrating system and collect data from all over, and there's often, often any, um, so how do you overcome such issue, uh, especially in, in our part of the world? Yeah. So typically like the, the real estate owner will have like, you know, the on the larger end, like 20 to 40 external different providers. And, um, and we have an app that basically can access so that your, your data provider will be able to install and, and get access to the database behind and automatically generate APIs. So you'll be able to access to the source data and not, nothing that has been appended by a user by adding some comments on it. So the, the most important thing here is to be able to get access to the original data extract and nothing that has been, you know, exported and, and, and used in a PDF format, for example, that's not possible to read, but um, you have to, we have to get access to the source data and there it's possible to, to do it. Obviously garbage in, garbage out. Um, 
if there's any mistakes in the in the data, we can't correct the mistake by itself. Uh, we have some transformation logics that will allow you to, for example, say, you know, uh, end date of a lease agreement is before the start date. And there's like a, a logic that can be written to tell you there's a mistake here. Um, so we have those type of things as well to be able to clean the data thereafter. But um, it's it's a case by case. So we have to, to look at, um, you know, the situation in Hong Kong and, and see if it's similar to what we have in Europe. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Akina, final question. Hi, Julian. Okay. So if, when I first saw your PowerPoint, you said no code software. So I assume it's for people like me, not very technical. But when you were showing me a demo, I have no idea what you were doing. So then in my mind, I'm thinking, are you a MuSoft kind of software? Or are you a Tableau kind of software? Or are you a Power BI software? Or are you in between? Or are you the back end? It's like, what is it? Yeah. Is your, who do you see yourself as, a, as your competitor? Yeah, so on the data aggregation side, there's definitely tools like MuleSoft that will access, will allow you to access to the, the legacy systems out there. Um, and, and, and it's not built for real estate, so they don't have pre-built APIs for the real estate industry. For example, Rentwall is very different um, across the world. And, um, and so we have that real estate angle. On the other hand, we have apps that will do workflows. So you can, for example, generate a lease agreement so that's but that will be used by the user, right? Uh, the leasing manager or the asset manager at the client's level. So those are the two types of services we we offer. One is data aggregation, and that is definitely more technical. Uh, you'd have to have a bit of understanding of data. And on the ha other hand, you have the the user part, which are those apps, and they can be used by by any you know any user out there who wants to generate a flyer, a report, build a dashboard around the portfolio. Excellent questions. Good answers. Congratulations, Julian, on your successes. We will now move into the second section of the Hong Kong stuff of the startup competition. It is the investment startup pitches, and we will put three minutes on the clock for Brand Crafter. Please begin your presentation now. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good, Steve. Sounds good. Okay. Can you um, see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. So my name's Steve. I'm the CTO and interim CEO at Brandcrafter. And today I'd like to talk to you about our product white paper. So white paper gives you real estate insights for any location in the world in under five minutes. And it literally works anywhere, including North Korea. Uh, so what problem does white paper solve? So traditionally, if you need data for your real estate projects, you'll contact a large company like CBRE or JLL, and they will make a report for you. But it takes three to four weeks. It'll cost you at least 200,000 Hong Kong dollars. Whereas our reports take less than five minutes and cost less. So what problem does white paper solve? So um, not only are we creating reports cheaper and, and, and quicker, but we're also analyzing the data. So we're not just presenting data to you and then you need your in turn to interpret the data, we'll actually try to figure out insights and present them to you. Um, so our product, as I said, it's an insights and inspirations tool. Um, help you quickly get ideas and insights for your real estate projects. And it's very simple. You, we just need your project address. And then we will break down the usages in the area, the real estate usages. We will figure out the dominant lifestyle group in the area. That's who, who lives there, who shops there, who visits there. And we'll also give you three ideas for your project. And they're very specific. Um, and our feedback, feedback from our customers is they are almost exactly what they are thinking of building at their project. Um, so how does it work? Uh, very difficult to explain this in three minutes. But in a nutshell, we, we analyze thousands of data points. We've created a multiple machine learning algorithms that do some magic on, on, on these data points. And that figures out the usages and the lifestyle group at your location. Um, we then compare your location globally um, to find what we call your real estate twin. So this is an area, it could be anywhere in the world, but has a similar, similar usages and similar lifestyle groups. We then look at the businesses in that area and we use those to recommend uh, what you could open up uh, at your project location. And this is all done in real time. And, and as I said, in less than five minutes. So our competitors are the big companies like CBRE and JLL. We're not ready to replace them yet, but we're, we're getting there. Um, but we're quite different. So we, we are, we've removed humans from the process altogether. It's all technology. 
So we can analyze massive amounts of data um, in a few minutes. Um, we've removed bias. Now there'll always be a little bit of bias with machine learning, but we've put in a lot of effort to remove that. And of course, machines are less likely to make a mistake during an analysis. Um, and, and as I've said multiple times, we're much quicker and much cheaper. And our customers, we're targeting mainly um, real estate developers and the ho and hotel industry. Uh, we currently have customers in mainland China, Germany, and USA, and they're all real estate developers. And we're currently partnering with a, a real estate analytics company in Europe and to tap into their um, customer base. Ten seconds to conclude, Steve, please. Okay, finally, our board of directors, all senior real estate people. Eugene Tang is the family member of the Kewa Group. Berger Werner, chairperson of ULI Switzerland. Thomas Evick, a senior architect, senior real estate strategist. And Annette Chamel, who's a strategist. Thank you, Steve. Um, Thank you. If I had a second, I'd okay. Okay. Thank nice. you very much. Excellent presentation. We need to move into the three minute q and I'm sorry for being overly efficient here, but giving everybody their fair share. Great presentation. We'll start at the top again, alphabetically with Akina. Hi, Steve. Okay. Hi. So basically I have a question. Where do you get the data source to create the data that you said is more comprehensive than the great years? So that's one of my big, uh, big issues. And because, uh, and the second point of your business model is the algorithm, which a lot of people can do now. So what really, the, mainly I want to ask, what do you get your data source? Because that's going to differentiate you. And then what is your market barrier? Uh, if it's a public a data that anyone can, can, can get hold of and create what you created. Okay, so our first product was a product to um, analyze the brand, brands for the branding industry. So basically we created a system to crawl hundreds of thousands of, of articles every month. Uh, also crawling company websites, crawling blogs, magazines, newspapers. And we apply machine learning to this crawling to understand cultural information, to understand what people care about. So that's the first, where we first get our data. And although you, you say it's easy, anyone can do this, it took us a couple of years using a couple of data science professors to be able to get to the point. Thank you. So it, Steve. You can do it, but it's, it's not easy. I apologize. Is that the question? Through. Yeah, you're coming in and out a little bit for me. I don't know if it's the same for yep, others. Same. Yeah. Yeah, but I think right. I get the gist of it. Yeah, thanks. You got the gist. All right. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Akina. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, Andrew. Yeah, same, same question as well. Because I mean, one, one, one of Eddie, if we pay CBRE and and because we we trust the data set and they their bread and butter is collecting the data. So, so I guess my same question too is for a startup, you may have a good algorithm, but you will take time to really grow the algorithm. So, I mean, garbage in, garbage out, but, but you, know, you may have a perfect algorithm, but uh, you need that. So, so how can you convince, I can see the, the speed because, you know, you can come up with a lot of things much faster, but how do you convince uh, a customer that you're going to have enough data set or accurate data set to convince us the report from you is better than what we pay J CBRE for? Okay, um, I would say right now the report won't be better than CVRE or JLL. It's one of the reasons why they're so expensive. So, but what we can guarantee is you'll get a report very quickly to get initial ideas. And every customer we've had so far, literally every customer has said, we've understood their location perfectly and it confirmed what they were thinking of building. So I'm very confident in the quality of what we produce. Um, but you bring up a really good question, which is convincing people to try us instead of just playing it safe and going with JLL or CBR. And that is, that is really our challenge as a company. We're a small guy trying to disrupt the industry. But when people see our product, they get it and they realize how good it is. And they, for example, we have a customer in mainland China. They just bought another nine reports off us this month uh, because they believe in what we're doing. Excellent. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, thank you for the, I think it's uh, a great idea. It's almost like uh, yellow pages of real estates. And uh, I, I also agree that uh, with uh, Akina that uh, there are also some uh, biases in the data because you said that uh, the data is from uh, crawling from magazines and at the end, you know, behind the magazine, just an editor and, and so on. And also one area that I think you can focus on is uh, perhaps the financial institute and the banks. When they look at valuation and, and the you know, the, if the project works or not, I think that's a key area that you have to convince, not just the clients themselves. Thank you. Yep. Okay. 
Thank you, Antonio. Uh, Eric, a final question. It was really about the uh, the cost model, the fee model. Uh, you know, you're sort of positioning uh, less than the you know the real estate houses like CBRA, GLL. Where, where do you sort of position yourself? You know, versus the product and output that you're. You know, what's the value prop proposition? Is the so, short question. Sure. So what we're really aiming at is when you need a result quick. So I'll give an example. We're uh, in negotiations with a potential customer at the moment. They are a hotel chain. And they want to use our product to um, look at many different locations to see where they should invest and build hotels. So they can't really do this with JLL because it's too expensive and takes too long. But using our product, they can go to Thailand, look at 100 different locations, figure out which one works best for what they want and, and build there. So it's really when you need something quick and um, quick, it's quick and cheap, quick and cheap. You get quick ideas quickly. Is it like less than a thousand dollars, less than five thousand yeah. dollars, less than ten thousand dollars? Sure. One report, if you just buy one, is is ten thousand Hong Kong dollars. If you get a subscription, it depends on how many you buy. It gets cheaper. We also give API access. So if you don't need our reports, you just want to tap into our data. Uh, that's even cheaper again. Thank you, Steve. Excellent presentation. Well done on the Q and A. Thank you, judges. We're now going to move on to the second startup in this subcategory of investment startup pitches, Real X. The floor is yours. You have three minutes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, just a second, I'll share my screen. I hope you can see that. Yes, we can see it, Manish. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, this is VLX. Uh, we are a digital platform for property co-ownership uh, or fractional ownership as it is called in the industry. I am joined today by uh, myself, Manish, and Neera, Hi. my co-founder. Good evening, guys. So, uh, so this is the co-founding team. We have experience uh, you know, uh, in private equity, real estate, and creating alternate platforms uh, you know, before. Uh, we are advised uh, by a very good bunch of advisors, you know, which include uh, ex-regulators, uh, some senior folks from the capital market and financing industry. So what is the problem that we are trying to address? Uh, you know, uh, principally, we allow people to become co-owners in high value, high yielding you know, properties, which, uh, uh, which otherwise they do not have access to, uh, to invest in because of the property uh, you know, uh, size, the value. Uh, and number two, we allow them to do that digitally. Uh, I'll explain how it you know, really works. Uh, this is the legal model of uh, you know, RealX. What we offer to our customers is equitable, undivided co-ownership of property. In France, they also, called, uh, they also call this uh, you know, direct deeded property co-ownership. So what really happens is there's a registered document done at the, at, the, at the local registrar's office. However, we have introduced the concept of a custodian, uh, you know, who would go and register the property on behalf of all the pro equitable co-owners whose names and the proportionate co consideration amounts are also uh, mentioned as an annexure into the property deed. So they become legal, uh, you know, full evidentiary value co-owners of the property. Uh, the stamp duties, registration, et cetera, all the fees, et cetera, are paid. Uh, we have standardized the, the mutual rights and obligations that these co-owners uh, will have. For example, that, uh, you know, they can sell uh, their, their fractions, uh, you know, freely on the RealX platform to anyone else and doesn't need any, uh, 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 you know, go ahead from anyone else, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, such rights and obligations become the standard component of every sale deed that we, that we registered. In a way, kind of, you know, creating our market and, you know, creating standard market uh, on its own. Uh, one other thing that uh, that is worth mentioning, since we are kind of designing RealX to be like a capital market for uh, for real estate, we had to standardize the instrument that people transact upon. The instrument is called FRAX, uh, which represents essentially one square inch of an undivided area, and uh, all the rights and obligations as registered, you know, in the sale deed. Uh, so there's a lot of legal innovation, you know, that that is behind uh, RealX that helps us create the scalable, you know, marketplace architecture. So uh, 
like any other platform, I would you know briefly define what you know really happens in a property is is vetted uh, initially and listed on the platform. It gets the sub once the property is subscribed by various co-owners, uh, you know, committing their their ownership. The due diligence and the deal execution is then carried upon, and the uh, custodian goes ahead and registers the property. And the same registered sale deed, you know, is thereafter. Uh, thereafter uh, you know shared with all the co-owners this data is this co-ownership data is also then credited to a blockchain based uh, registry system called uh, propchain uh, and that's when the you know genesis uh, of of this data you know begins so that's the purchase part the the on the post purchase side uh, the, uh, with every property that we bring in onto the platform there is an asset manager also involved uh, so the the that post post the property the, uh, deal documents are executed Manish. Well, only so, 10 seconds remaining okay so i'll i'll skip this one so in terms of our go to market uh, we have, we have developed a platform as a service model wherein we we work with all the developers and tell them that you become the principal entity and like a payment gateway we are behind you enabling you to uh, fractionalize any of your assets so however units or whatever strategy they want to you know kind of run they are free to run that is a, a model that has been you know uh, successful uh, very running successfully very well uh, so far, uh, you know, our in terms of our revenues, uh, there is certain revenues that we that that we earn from the seller side uh, on the primary transactions, and from the uh, customer side, we take one percent, and we also have uh, uh, ten percent of the carry uh, from the investor when they sell. This is okay. our competition. Most of the competition. Sorry. Has, has yeah, a I'm sorry, we need to finish here. All right. No, so, fine. thank you, thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation um here and i want to uh, thank you for uh, uh, sharing with us today we're going to go in reverse order if the judges can come back on um we're going to start with uh, eric if you uh, can kick us off please yeah no great thank you uh, great idea um one of the things that you've you've seemed like you try to tackle is the the legal sort of aspects uh, this you know very much you know key component uh, you've got this frac sort of uh, model but uh, that's also the part that i think is still kind of a journey for you. I think that's still going to be an obstacle. Um, what sort of markets do you sort of envisage where you're going to have the least uh, legal sort of um, restrictions or, or, or inhibitions where you can grow <clears throat> fastest? So, so the easy answer that I can give you is, uh, you know, in any market that we that we intend to enter, we need to study the the legal, uh, you know, architecture of the, of, of uh, how the property laws are. However, what helps in our case is India being a English common law jurisdiction. Uh, the laws are similar when we apply to DFSA as well. So they also have English common law. So, so all, the, all the definitions are common. So in UK, Singapore, uh, India, and all the English common law jurisdictions, we kind of will have a lot of semblance. And with minor changes, we believe that we can scale exactly the same model. Right, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Antonio, you're next. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I think it's almost like you're creating the Robin Hood of real estate. You know how Robin Hood can share micro shares where you're breaking apart real estates and, and sh sharing the micro you know, the square, the square foot. But uh, I think one thing that would be honest is, uh, is there a market for, you know, for Robin Hood, you have the shares uh, trading at high volume uh, daily. How about for real estate? I have a question whether there is such a market for it. And that's the first thing I want to say. And the second is, uh, also, the legal aspect of of that on of uh, different countries as well, what uh, Eric mentioned earlier. Yeah, so thank you, Antonio, for the good words. Uh, uh, you know, the the last question first, uh, the legal aspect I just mentioned. So we'll have to look into every jurisdiction wherever we go in. However, it's easier when we approach English common law because they will have some similar basis, uh, you know, to begin with. Uh, you know, and uh, regarding your first question. Um, I would so uh, I, I missed out on the first question, Antonio. So yeah. the market for this, you know, where if it's traded high volume, then it's good. But so, I have a so, question about that. Yeah, I think you're talking about the secondary sales market uh, being created because primary you can do and what happens to the resale. Uh, we are talking to a lot of data players in the market to, to enable all the users with equivalent data of... Uh, Howsoever much they hold into any property, because the common properties out there would be, you know, going for a certain going rate. This kind of creates a market which is uh, like a fixed income kind of uh, market for at least yielding assets. 
and therefore there needs there there will be a lot of decision support system that we would provide for them to transact we will also be processing the secondary transactions onto the platform and representing them into the registrar office to 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 uh, to close on the transaction thank you thank you uh, andrew yeah uh, my question is quick uh, the Usually, um, I mean, uh, two aspects. Uh, one is a cultural aspect. I think there are people still want to own a whole apartment than a unit of a square foot or something. I mean, that's, that's one aspect is uh, whether the market will accept such a things. And the second aspect is when you have transactions on and off, uh, you, you're bound to attract a lot of uh, attention from the regulators. And that's when, you know, the system will, will really be coming into a lot of administration costs and governance and whether you can be sustainable or not. I think that, that will be a challenge down the road. Just these two comments. Uh, you know, so uh, thank you for uh, raising that. And that is why uh, in India we do uh, registered sale deeds. So, so far, uh, no regulations do apply. But eventually we do hope regulations and the right regulations really come in, you know, and regulate such platforms, which kind of opens up the markets with uh, more participation because the trust of the consumers increase when regulation really comes in. So we believe that uh, with more tokenization, et cetera, et cetera, happening, and we also want, are sitting on the cusp of that. We, uh, we put the registry on blockchain, but haven't tokenized yet because there is no custody of tokens, et cetera, laws, you know, past year. Having said that, uh, the reason we apply to DFSA uh, there, uh, and there we are getting into a you know regulated uh, territory with all the AML layers uh, on top of that, we believe uh, reasonably that this is uh, going to be a very exciting sector as we look forward to actually creating an exchange for real estate. So, uh, so regulation is something that we would embrace happily. Excellent. Thank you, Manish. And Nira, and thank you, uh, uh, Akina, a uh, final question. Okay, so it's more comments. I studied a company three years ago that did exactly what you did, but they're much more advanced three years ago than you are. So, so you can check them out. It's A-I-O-O-K-I. -O -O so there's a couple of things that everybody, all the judges mentioned, you must pay attention. Culture is an issue, especially in India, right? How trust worthy is your system to validate that this property is real owned by the person who's listing it for co-ownership do you have a mindset of building an ecosystem of puckling in the uh, brand name lawyers to support all the transaction that goes through your system and after the purchasing you must have a custodian that's also reputable to manage voting of selling and and, and exiting you know, among the group of different investors. It, it's a it's a big thing and regulation, you have to pay attention because there's a huge uh, debate if, if tokenization might be approved, but tokenization of security in property may not be because of there's a lot of uh, deeds and titles and entitlement that's involved in it. It's a very costly operational and data driven and validation platform. If you don't have that intact, your system will not survive. Akina, is there a specific question in there? Or well, just I'm just saying that based on everything I just told you, do you really have a plan to put this all together? Because for what I'm seeing is a concept, but I don't see all the components that's going to drive this to be a realistic, practical platform people to actually use because there's so many issues. So again, uh, that you know, let's lay the blame on three minutes. Then uh, we couldn't really lay out on the on the ecosystem that it has taken us to to go this far. Uh, just uh, short answers. Uh, just like any banks, uh, when they impanel a lot of law firms all across uh, their geographic uh, territory that they operate, we also will impanel a lot of law firms. It is the law firms that will do all the registration and all that facilities. Uh, all the title, uh, all the real estate properties will be very, very thoroughly vetted, and uh, you know we will refund the money if even if the uh, transaction is successful, uh, if we if it doesn't clear a certain threshold uh, recommended by the lawyers. So that is one part uh, regarding the market. I think this is the second time that I'm being asked about it. 30% of of the real estate uh, market in India is is investment property. So uh, and what we what we shared there was even if Realex gets one percent of that into uh, you know into the fractional uh, you know asset space, I think we are looking at a six hundred million you know to start with, 
and and wherever you have been able to digitize assets and break broken down the investments into smaller fractions it has actually multiplied the market hopefully that will play out and at the same time regulation will play in so we are happy to uh, welcome regulation thank you all for your questions we will now move on to the third of four semi-final subcategory sustainability and we will hand the floor for three minutes to green coat oliver hi everyone um can you hear me yes we can hear you yeah awesome. can, can, can you see my screen yes please proceed okay awesome so you can see my slides yep okay okay awesome thank you so good evening. I'd like you to imagine a green technology out there that not only reduces the cost of operating buildings, but also increases the, the value of your property. Too good to be true? Well, not anymore. Introducing Green Co, our smart window solution that will enable savings for you while saving the planet. Currently in Hong Kong, um, there is, yeah, um, in Hong Kong, air conditioning and lighting make up on average 70 to 80% of a typical Hong Kong building's total energy consumption. It's an issue that's particularly exacerbated by heat gain through windows in summer and heat loss through windows in winter. For our customers, this means high ongoing electricity costs and energy inefficient buildings. Currently, there is also no end-to-end -end energy saving solution to address their issues. Introducing Green Coat, a next generation plasma coating electrochromic smart window solution that changes window opacity in response to different environmental conditions to maximize energy efficiency. Our product offering is made up of three core tenants, the plasma coating electrochromic smart windows itself, secondly, an automated HVAC and lighting control system, and thirdly, a live da dashboard and analytics platform. Um, so uh, we'll be targeting our initial target markets of property developers and property managers with an end-to-end -end offering that is significantly cheaper, smarter, greener, and simpler than anything else currently on market. How so? Well, Green Coat uses a new technology, high power impulse magnetron sputtering to produce a 70 nanometer tungsten oxide plasma coating that is composed only of three layers as opposed to the existing norm of five layers currently in the market. Traditionally, smart windows require whole plane panels of glass to be replaced, but our plasma coating can be retrofitted onto any existing glass. The installation is as simple as putting a screen protector on your phone. These smart windows, these smart win these smart windows um, these smart windows are connected to an automated building management system which adjusts lights and HVAC in response to the shade of windows. For example, on a hot day, the windows become more opaque and the lighting will dim as a result, and the aircon will be turned down to reflect the changes happening outside. These live changes can be monitored on our smart window dashboard and analytics platform, which allow the user to see tangible results from their green code investment in real time. Investing in green coat will improve tenant comfort, control glare, and optimize energy usage, reducing costs by at least 20 to 30%. Green coat technology will also help property developers and managers achieve green certifications for their buildings, a feature that will bring an extra revenue through the resulting higher property and rental value. Our data-driven solution also allows them to see their energy, their end-to-end -end solution, allows them to see their energy savings and financial savings in real time as well as trends in their energy usage, which will provide them return on investment data that they can provide as business justification to upper management. We're delighted to have testing partners on board and several warm leads um, currently in negotiations. For New World, they were motivated by how Green Coat could reduce their costs while also opening a new revenue stream for them. For well, EY Wave Space, remaining. Green Coat is an integral part of their CSR strategy, um, especially with more and more clients placing sustainability as a business priority. The biggest draw card, though, is the ability to track their return on investment in real time. Um, so we have a strong team and in, with a diverse background. So if you want more energy efficient buildings that will increase financial savings, increase the value of your real estate in the post-pandemic world while saving the planet, then pick Green Coat, the only coating that will keep you cool Thank in you summer sorry. and warm in winter. Yeah, we, we, need to, we need to move into the questions here. Excellent presentation, Akino. Uh, if you can go with your video, I would love to uh, have you kick us off with questions, please. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, technically, I, I don't know this technology, so I can't question you on the technology, but this sounds good. I mean, if it works, I, I, you made a comment about increased revenue. 
How do you guys mm-hmm. help the property real estate developer increase revenue? Cost saving, I get this. The green award, I get it. Better, you know, automations and all that. But how do you make extra money? Yep, that's a good question. So basically, um, basically the way we're going to bring in extra revenue streams for our customers is um, our technology um, will be a will, is a key fact, a key component of um, them being able to. Um, achieve green certifications in particular um, such as the H Hong Kong GBC Beam Plus certification and what we found and what we confirmed with our customer is when these buildings have green certifications um, it increases the value of the the property so they can increase the the rent rent and the yeah what they can charge their customers okay and thank you all right Andrew second question um, it's um, I mean, we look at several of these technology, and, and there are there are different technology around that uh, offer similar thing. But but one thing, have you considered the issues? Is that the customer paying, you know, a lot of money in a central office, looking out into the harbor, um, and and your window of automatically turns opaque. I mean, the the customer may not want that to happen, um, mm. and and you know because I pay so much for my view. Even though that uh, that 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 is energy saving, and that's question number one. And and then the um, the um, I mean heat transfer through is conductivity, convection, radiation. So so yep. is this? Uh, there are a few similar technology around. So have you compared with other technology that comes up with better heat transfer across not just a sink, not 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 just the convection part of it, but the you know, the, the, the other three factors as well. Yep, um, so that's a really good question. Firstly, in your point about the view, um, so it's a very good point, um, uh, but our our window, our smart windows can go from fully transparent to, to opaque. So when there isn't any sun, um, it can go to a, a full, um, full, you know, full transparent view. When there is sun, um, usually you would have to put down your curtain. So that would block out the, or blinds, that would block out the view completely. Our green coat smart window technology means that you can still see the view when it is that sunny that you need to put down your blinds. Um, And in terms of your second question in regards to the technology and how we compare to similar alternatives or other alternatives on the market. So we've actually been refining the technology even further and we've, we've got some, developments in the silver nanoparticle space, which is the middle layer, and that will increase um, electrical conductivity and also improve the switching times even more. And that's a recent development that we've made. Um, The silver nanoparticles have been shown to increase performance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Super, thank you. Um, Antonio? Hi, thank you for the presentation. I believe that going green is the, you know, with the extreme weather coming up. Then one question I have for you is the manufacturing. Do you do it yourself and how many patents do you have? Mm-hmm. Um, so with manufacturing, the capital equipment that's required, we current, the capital equipment is around 250,000 to a million US dollars. So currently what we're doing is until we get, you know, um, more seed, like more funding is we're partnering with, existing manufacturers such as BDI, um, such as BDI and also um, uh, Hauser and, sorry, not Hauser, VDI and also Plasma Tech as well. So existing um, companies that can, um, that, that have that plasma coding um, uh, capability. Um, in terms of your second question, um, which was about patents, uh, yes, so we have patents that we are currently in the process of applying for. We have currently around five and we're processing that with the patents department in Hong Kong at the moment. Excellent, thank you. And final question from Eric. Great, thank you. It's really a question just about the extent of demand um, because in some ways, you know, I, I really love this idea, but at the same time, I'm just wondering whether it's almost like a bit of overkill. It's like having, you know, uh, electronic leasing, you know, uh, basketball boots, uh, because you can get a film coating uh, windows. You can actually, ha- you know, cut down a lot of the 
you know, the emissions that you don't want um, that are very, like very high. And I assume that the price, you know, difference is is also you know one comp, you know, composition. And then it's all this uh, extra, you know, additions that you make. Do you really need all those sorts of things to achieve? You know, what's your purpose? Your purpose is really to lower the energy costs uh, of the building. Um, so the bells and whistles, you know, uh, who's going to appreciate that? Who's the mm. audience? Yep, so it's a good question and thanks for the question. And pretty much um, in addition to um, reducing costs, the reason why we have the other components of our package um, is that auto having automated um, HVAC and lighting control that, that adjusts um, at the same time in sync um, with the smart window opacity is that it will reduce um, it will reduce basically energy usage even more. So currently when you, for example, put down the blinds when it's very, um, very hot or very sunny, you have to increase the lighting and the HVAC as a result. So basically the reason why we have um, the automated control is so that it's all automated, especially in the pandemic situation where you don't want to be touching curtains and that kind of stuff. And also with the live analytics platform the reason why we've included it is because of the customer feedback that we've received they want to be able to risk um they they have had a lot of i guess different companies come to them trying to work with them but they they haven't been able to you know sort of show the return on investment and that's why we've included it in our package to differentiate ourselves and really so that our customers can track their and not only their energy savings, but also their financial savings in real time. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you so much. Great Thank job. Uh, well, it's time Thank to move on to the next startup, uh, Urmanetic. Uh, you have the floor and you have three minutes to present. Fable, we cannot hear you. Okay, so is that all right now? Yes, yeah, thank you. All right, cool. All right, so we go here. Um, okay, good evening, everybody. Okay, good. So, um, uh, so uh, we start with the declining state of many of our cities is largely because of the inadequate planning, funding, operations, lack of best practices, and a data process system tools and governance. And this whole thing came out for the recent McKinsey report, uh, uh, first published in 2017 and then uh, uh, just a few, few months ago. Um, and we're looking at the productivity growth is uh, less than 1% and losing 1.6 trillion a year. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but more specifically, the the, the pain points are actually cost, time, and performance visualization across the value chain. And that available solution that today they have in no longer scale to solve the problem, including the so-called BIM. Um, so the, we, we basically develop a web platform uh, for anyone to rapidly build a digital uh, 3D parametric model of any city and be able to discover gaps and opportunities, and then simulate scenarios to find optimum ways to solve a problem. Uh, it's like could be uh, analyzing a a sustainability requirement for a building, an architect is building, uh, so he's working on maybe a, a SketchUp uh, and he can drag and drop into the real world and understand what cash flows and, 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 and the financial also about the sustainability requirement. Uh, and then you can edit and then we can re-export back into the SketchUp model. So we have three applications at the moment. Uh, we have uh, master planning, site planning, and the feature Assetization. I don't like to use the word tokenization. So some people uh, comment and they, they probably don't like it. So because of the fractionalization, uh, either we do an, a traditional SPV route or using digital tokens. So this is what it is. So here's how it works. So someone in the Singapore uh, sitting there can create his or her own copy of virtual Melbourne um, by automatically through APIs and web services, getting all the data, 
uh, assimilating them. Uh, so the person is a developer by clicking on one piece of a land application can suggest the way to carve out the land with roads, generate buildings, automatically through our procedural generation engine and suggest the impact of such a development. So you can create multiple development sites. So basically two or three development on maybe a seven or eight acre site and then basically give it to the architect, uh, the massing model and the architect can be more de detailed design. So, uh, so basically, just how it works, and again, the value problem connecting back, linking back to the cus uh, customer pain points, as we can well see why customers like uh, to work with us is big because of performance visibility creates for the master planner as well as uh, uh, cities, the speed and as obviously access and, co and collaboration, uh, whether it is for uh, investment purpose or whether it is for, uh, for analysis or whether it is for exploration and visualization. Uh, so to team, uh, my name is Saibal, uh, and I, I'm the co-founder and CEO on Urbanetic, uh, a software platform uh, to, uh, to, for the urban, metri uh, urban metrics to reduce resource consumption and boost performance of the built environment. So I have 28 years experience in this technology, which is data engineering and products and manufacturing engineering design. So we are basically applying the same uh, into here. Uh, my partners are Jose and Anup and uh, Oliver, as you see, he's, he's been in, in Google. Um, and also at the moment, he's an advisor to the company. Uh, market size again. This Only was a tough seconds, uh, few assumption. I have spent a good number of years in in product. So this is basically a market size. This is a business model, as you say. Annual subscription paper use uh, one on, on on premise installation as well as uh, basically percentage on the fundraising competition. As I said, is a unique selling proposition. Uh, which basically our, our as for our strategy, uh, our advantage is basically to put it onto a, a broader market space but a smaller uh, percentage and, and a higher margin. Uh, these are the testimonials uh, from uh, Singapore as well as uh, from Norway. Uh, sorry, and uh, with that, yeah. I'd like to finish my uh, presentation uh, that's about our business of software service optimized urban metrics to reduce resource consumption and improve the total performance of the built environment. Thank All you very right. much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for this great presentation. And we'll move back to the judges' questions. We have three minutes for them. Akina, would you uh, get us started this time, please? Right, okay. Um, I can't really tell what the product does. So, um, I, I, so I'm trying to visualize it, uh, how you can help people with simulations and stuff. So I scan a virtual picture of the layout of the land. So does your system uh, includes architecture design from another firm and then pluck it in and said, I want to build a uh, five uh, building mm -hmm. residential with, you know, 700 units. Does it do uh, all that? What okay. is it? Do? No, we actually are using our APIs, public and private APIs to collect all the small, small data about lots and the buildings and the fixtures and everything assimilate them into our uh, uh, model. So what we have done is we have actually our uh, secret sauce is actually generic model of a city. So this is basically a unified model, just like our generic model. So when we basically wrote a schema, whenever so it's a city grammar, basically. So all the loose pieces that we get together, we can actually algorithmically build the 3D model of the exact model of the city. Right. And once that is done, which is a vector, then you could actually basically run your analysis. So for example, it could be a cash flow modeling or anything. And you can actually take the existing building, it's an old building, you can basically hide it, delete it, expose the lot, and then you say procedural generation comes in. It, we actually have digitized even the regulation of all the setbacks, the height limits, the shadows, and everything. And it will tell you within the regulation, if you stay, this is the cash flow you can make for the next 10 years. And these are the impact on flooding, traffic, and everything. It's not only just building, we can do it even for a precinct. So does it do the ROI calculations too, saying that let's yes. say seven? Oh, yes. I mean, the standard. Yeah, you can actually even take a standard estate manager's calculation, plug it in and basically run it and yeah. say that this is what the cash flow would be. And the, the, and that is important for us because when we move into fractionalization and, and then basically and tokenization, you really need to basically build those models. So it's all done automatic and very fast. So we could actually build a whole Melbourne was built in uh, three hours. We took the entire Manhattan within one hour. It was all built. So you Thank have a 3D model of Manhattan in one hour. And then you can run your analysis. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, who would be who do you sell it to? The the the, the government or the developer, and who will be willing to pay for well, the data? I think the way now the model works. Uh, initially, we started with uh, all the municipalities. So, when we learned is and we found out that fundraising is an issue because we need a private one. So now we have focused on the developers. 
and the architects and the planners. So what is happening is now developer can click and design his massing model himself, very simple, and then give it to the architect. He doesn't have to go to valuer, he doesn't have to go to planner. Straight go to architect, an architect will build a single concept or maybe a, a sketch up and bring it back to our model and say, mm, whether it will work. And most of the places in Asia, like in we're working Vietnam and Cambodia, only two problems, traffic and flooding. So there's two simple calculations that we have to do and tell them whether it will work or not. Excellent. Uh, Antonio, your question. Actually, I don't have much question. I think this is uh, pretty amazing. And I, I'd like to try it myself. So. <laughs> Yeah, okay. go to our website, and there is a there is a is a public uh, uh, for Melbourne City. I, I think you, you, anybody can work with it. Thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, final question. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I, you know, I think it's also it's going to be really powerful, but it's the power will come from the the data and the information and the layers that you can put on top. So, you know, as an example, if you could layer, you know, what the what the market rental is for a particular building in that, you know, that you're choosing, if you could pick, you know, pick the occupancy historically, you can create like hotspots, you know, on your yep. on your or your map. Thank so you. the question then is uh, the data piece. Uh, one is you, you're getting some free data, you're, you're, you're trolling for that or you're getting access to that. The, the stuff that's going to be more powerful is really the ones that's going to cost you money. Uh, do you envisage like partnerships? You know, how are you going to, um, you know, tackle that aspect. Okay, just give me an example. Um, uh, we are working with ADB, we are working with uh, WF and so on. Say for example, mm. Philippines, right? They want to take yeah. over one of those uh, slums and they say, okay, if I uh, allow double the GFA of one slum area, okay, would these people, and then they cut it up and then put a Singapore style, let's say 10 story uh, apartments, and then mm. give these people to go and have you one own, and then he can actually, uh, go. So what our job will be to tell the government that by doubling or tripling the GFA, you don't have any traffic issues, you don't have any uh, other sustainability issues or any other yeah. issues, for okay. example. Exactly. Yeah, so that's where the data is very important. Now, our challenge is data at the moment. So when we get into this public and private APIs, now every data on the plot and the land has to be certified by authority. Now, these are actually coming in from outside. So what we do is when we do that, but it's a good starting point to go to municipality and authorities say, look, I have your city in 3D and you can do analysis. Then they open up and then we basically use uh, several techniques there to basically validate the height, the lot, the plot and everything. One, that period takes time, that probably two months. Once yeah, you validate it, then it's basically I guess the, the, there. the problem is, is that, uh, you know, if you just pick one city and you've chosen say like Melbourne or Philippines, uh, you'll saturate that market if you don't have more data to add to it. Yes. Oh, yeah, we have to. Keep so you need to grow your client base. Uh, Guys, uh, I'm sorry to do this, but we need to we need to uh, uh, wrap up these great points, great questions, and look forward to continuing the conversation after the competition here. But to give everybody their fair shot, we're going to move on to the final uh, subcategory user experience uh, for the startup competition here in Hong Kong, and we will cede the floor for three minutes to Dreamhouse. Hi. Uh, how do I share a the screen? Here? Let's see. At the bottom, the green box. I green. So, so, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Cancel. I'm not seeing. Uh, sorry about this. Option call. Cool. Yeah. All Thank right. You. Yes. Great job. Oh, sorry. Uh, right. I'll get started then. Hi, Go ahead. my name is uh, uh, I'm the CEO of Dreamhouse. Uh, we're a housing as a service company where our users can live, work, play, and everything in between. Our mission is to make the world a home through a network of uh, flexible stay, smart apartments and workspaces. And we plan to be the first housing as a service company. The problem we're addressing is uh, expensive housing in cities around the world. The demand for more robust, more similar to how would you say as uh, uh, luxury apartment services, and uh, the underutilization of empty spaces. This has all kind of been pushed to the brink or worsened by uh, COVID nineteen. 
a lot of work from home. So our solution allows our users to have all inclusive uh, living standards, better services in their units, similar to Amazon Prime or Blue Apron and uh, customizable experiences in terms of excursions or events within the city. On the sides of our owners and uh, I guess our customers really, they have higher returns, easier management of their units and a better valuation when they partner with us. The market size we're looking to service here is uh, about a $2 billion, oh, I'm sorry, $2 billion uh, trip market for bookings worldwide, a 53 million budget online serviceable market that we're looking at. And we're looking at some of the largest or most expensive markets uh, in the world, such as Hong Kong, London, et cetera. Our product is the Dream App, which allows our users to check in, check out, uh, move to new units under one monthly lease, uh, make room requests, this sort of thing, uh, also pay their rent. Our landlords on the other end can track who's using their units, uh, what they're using in their units, how much of it, and can change their, uh, I guess, pricing around this idea month to month as they need to and also no worries for them for the most part. Our target market tends to be between the ages of 25 and 45. A lot of them are startups. Some of them are young professionals that are just traveling. A lot of them want to be nomads. And increasingly more, a lot of people are in new cities coming from like California to Atlanta. Our competition is Airbnb. We live in Synergy, uh, global housing. Airbnb is a bit unpredictable and really focused on short-term stays. Uh, we live on the other end is overpriced uh, and crowded and not really connected to their co-working spaces in terms of membership. And Synergy Global Housing is kind of behind the times and how they're doing their service apartments. Our business model right now, we're doing a leasing fee with our landlords for four to nine percent, uh, where we list their property on our website. Uh, we do a bit of management for them after the listing is, I guess, filled. We do the management for them and transition to a more of a uh, master lease. Our subscription model is the $50 a month membership for our members to be able to move and in, move around the network of ours, enjoy events, and uh, yeah, I guess be a part of the dream house or the dream club membership. Yeah. Uh, platform John, service. House. Only 10 yes. seconds remaining. I, okay. I'll skip over that then. Right now we're seeing about a 19 NOI of 19% NOI uh, in Hong Kong uh, and the 500,000 uh, Hong Kong dollars a year. And we're in several different markets. Hong Kong, London, Atlanta, and uh, moving to Nairobi and Austria at the moment. Impressive. Thank you, John. Great presentation. We're going to move to the three minute Q&A with the judges and we'll start at the uh, uh, bottom of the alphabet this time with Eric. Great, thank you. Uh, just a question on, on your sort of sales strategy. How are you gonna grow? You know, what are you actually doing to, to, to grow your numbers? Right, so we uh, typically partner with landlords within markets. So uh, because they have a, I guess, in-market knowledge of who's renting what, the neighborhoods and all this thing, we're able to do a 70-30 split with them where we take on 30% of the culture of like a corporate culture, I suppose, and they take on the 70% of like the local culture. So they help us move into these houses a bit easier. They help us meet uh, landlords who are looking to, I guess, move into or have their units kind of used by us. Into, inside of our network. And uh, they help us also determine what a fair price point is uh, pretty consistently. So that's been more or less our market. Or And we also have a sales handbook that our team uses in these new markets and small sales teams that are kind of built around that handbook as well. Thanks, John. Antonio, your question? I think that's how you acquired uh, more listing on your, on your platform. How about how you acquired more customers to be on your platform? How do we acquire more customers? So we do have a sales, I guess, a small sales team that uh, do local events that are again focused on the 70-30 split, trying to stay authentic to the culture of the certain market. So we are doing, say, like a arts or a music event. Uh, the art and music event would be a local, like I guess, a local selection instead of being somebody who flew in from somewhere else. But we also take the uh, occasionally from a cyber standpoint. We'll take a uh, cooking class, maybe uh, have someone record it in Atlanta or in New York or something, and then stream that for a Hong Kong team and do like a cooking class around that. So the experiences uh, that we're able to sell are what we're uh, kind of building our our uh, tenancy, I guess, list off of. Thank we you. The fund and the move on. Yeah. Thank you for that question and answer. Andrew, your question. Okay, um, in terms of uh, your cost of servicing, um, uh, uh, 
that will eat into the margin. So, so what's what's that like? And the cost of servicing, um, you know, transactions, and it's not just that you got to ensure things are clean up and, and transaction between customer the, the one and the next. Oh, okay. So that does vary, like that does vary market to market, and because we partner with vendors within the market to do the cleaning, some of the turnover, this sort of thing, it's. I would say it's not necessarily consistent yet. We do want it to get we do want it to get it to be consistent over markets. But right now, so for instance, example in Nairobi, maybe for all that we spend fifty dollars to maybe eighty per unit um a month. And but that's like obviously a very different market than say Hong Kong, where uh cleaning can be about two fifty or more uh per I wouldn't say per month, but per almost per stay, really. It can it varies. We also have in terms of the markets that we're servicing. Because they are different in terms of uh, medium, low, I wouldn't say low, but medium accessible and uh, luxury stays, the cleaning standards do kind of change between these spaces as well, in terms of like what they're cleaning, how well, and the items are there as well. So um, okay. Thank you. it's a bit hard to answer. Sorry. Yeah. Akina, your question? I'm sorry, Akina, we can't hear you at the moment. Right. Okay. Sorry. Um, it seems like you guys are building what Airbnb was eight years, 10 years ago. So uh, I just don't know how you're going to compete in the market uh, when you're doing things that they already done before going cheaper, you know, going longer is something that they can enter the market the next day. You have to understand Airbnb, the algorithm is so smart now that if you post your apartment up there, they tell you what is the nearby hotel fees is. And, and, and suggest you to change your price. If you put in the smart pricing to automatically change your price, it can be competitive to the hotels. And it's like, there's all these algorithm and all these cleaning services that's not part of their operational cost, but third party uh, company that plug into their system to manage like a whole ecosystem. So how are you gonna compete? Uh, so actually a lot of our members or landlord customers have been Airbnb or former Airbnb uh i guess renters or owners i'm not sure what the terminology they use all the time is but uh that have, have converted over could they prefer the long stay uh market that we're able to give and it's we're also offering like a second i guess market for them in the first place uh everybody also being really focused on the short stay and holiday makers um us being more so focused on service departments corporations that's well, what that's not true uh, because i am an airbnb okay, i'm sorry we have to wrap up um uh, here uh, and move on to the next in order to hit our uh, timing i'm sorry for that john for interrupting you and akina excellent question um uh, so we're going to move on to the final and uh, the eighth and final a startup. Uh, this is the last in the user experience category before we go to the jury deliberation. Uh, that is Roots. You have three minutes. Please, uh, please share your magic. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. My name is Joe and I'm the co-founder of Roots. It's my pleasure to be here to talk about a project. Roots is a robot advisory property and mortgage platform to analyze your personal profile, needs, and affordability for you to find your dream home. You have so a I'm sure. Yep. Okay. Is it's it not a... showing? Yeah, no. No, we don't have your presentation. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Let, let me let me uh, try it again. Sure, and uh, we'll reset the clock for you to start with a fresh three minutes. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. It's okay. Can you see it now? Still not. Hmm. Okay, one second. How about now? Yeah, good. Okay. So yeah, let me uh just quickly go back and sorry about the uh issue here. Okay. All right, let me start now. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, my name is Joe, and this is uh, Roots uh, Project. Roots is a robo aspiratory property and mortgage platform that analyzes your personal profile, needs, and affordability for you to find your dream home. So I'm sure every one of you knows that the Hong Kong property prices is one of the highest among the whole world. And uh, mortgage has become a necessity for uh, people who want to purchase a flat in Hong Kong. 
over 90% of the uh, residential transaction in Hong Kong requires a, a, a certain percentage of mortgage in order to complete. And that's where the million dollar pain point lies. So in full year 2020, there are over 400 cases of forfeit of deposit with a total number of over 400 million Hong Kong dollar deposit loss, which is only for the first cent uh, new property uh, purchase. That is on average one home buyer losing 1 million Hong Kong dollar every day, just like that as we speak. A lot of time it's not because of market sentiment that they think that uh, they should just forfeit and not complete the process, but because of intransparency and inefficiency of the uh, purchase process in Hong Kong that leads to the forfeit of deposit because they can't complete uh, the transaction in time. So at Roots, we aim to re uh, re redefine the um, current uh, purchase process in Hong Kong by simply reversing the existing user journey of buy now and pay later and apply later. So when users come on our website to go on our Roots pre-assessment uh, tool, they'll get to analyze their personal profile needs and affordability as we said. And Roots will suggest property based on their risk profile and loan tolerance level in order to give them a preliminary mortgage offer. In, uh, the most important thing here is that the user will be able to get a property suggestion that's affordable and uh, towards their preference. After that, they can do the online mortgage application together with the purchase process in order to avoid uh, any uh, delays or denied mortgage application. So as I, we always say, um, Roots is as simple as booking on an trip on Expedia. But the difference is, it's better to invest in a property than buying a plane ticket during the pandemics. <laughs> so uh, for our business snapshot, um, in full year 2020, we've com connected with 16 banks with uh, over 100 successful applications. The, the turnover is twice faster than you if you applied yourself through banks. Uh, the approval rate is over 95% uh, for, any, for any, anyone who have used our free assessment tool. And we've generated over 800,000 Hong Kong dollar in revenue, mostly in referral commission. And this is just our first full year of service. And we see a huge potential in this over 60,000 transaction, uh, property transactions per year market in Hong Kong. Uh, You're back to only our roots. 10 seconds remaining. Yep. Uh, both of our founders we met uh, have experience in the financial industry. We are also supported by the HGST uh, uh, University in Hong Kong, Cyberpunk Incubation Program, and FinTech Awards. With all the media coverage, we believe we have a strong background and support to our proven models. And that's it for today. We are Roots and we are rooting for your future. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. I got a kick out of your uh, uh, airline ticket. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Medical. That was great. Um, we'll move to audience questions here, or to, uh, excuse me, judge questions. We're not doing any audience questions on this startup competition. We'll start at the top of the alphabet with Akina, please. Uh, one question for Joe. All right. So, you know, this is something that I believe is, is missing in Hong Kong, right? Um, I mean, it's pretty impressive. I assume you guys only been in operation in one year. You yep. have already linked up uh, 16 banks, and then uh, though the revenue is still very small, have you ever thought of using the same platform but extend beyond just mortgages? Yep, um, that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, what we're trying to do in 2021 and 2022 is to expand to uh, 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 other uh, sort of uh, revenue sources. For example, as you mentioned, uh, property purchase, because everyone knows that in Hong Kong, property purchase goes hand in hand with mortgage, as I just said. Um, so we also have a property selection mechanism built into our system right now, which is on beta. Um, we'll analyze a user's personal profile in order to select uh, properties based on location, say MTL stations, uh, number of bedrooms, uh, size, but transportation, facilities, et cetera. Outside of the real estate, like car loans, whatever loans. Okay, yeah, sure. We also have that options. Uh, we can link up to any loans that you can uh, get from a bank as uh, Great. because we have a referral uh, agreement with the banks. Thank you, Joe. Great questions, Akina and Andrew. Um, yeah, I mean, so, so okay, great to see the uh, the banks um, um, coming in, but what about customer side? Uh, so far, what's your reception like uh, on, on that front? So uh, I can give you a little bit of a uh, user uh, profile, uh, the normal users that we have. We are... Uh, on average, the age is around 30 to 35. They are a, a small family that they just started. And so, so they want to build up a family uh, with kids. So they're trying to get a, a house in Hong Kong. And there are over uh, uh, 1.8 million, uh, 1 million of 
first time millennial home buyers, that's what we call our target clients in Hong Kong looking to purchase. And the average uh, loan size is around four to five million Hong Kong dollar, taking around 80 or 90%, which is the maximum loan uh, percentage that they can get in Hong Kong. And for these group of people, we can easily reach them through social media. We, we have a, a very strong of over 5,000 people community over Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, that they always ask questions about buying properties, investments, and, and mortgage. So that's where mostly of our marketing and most of our uh, targeted clients are. Thank you. Antonio, your question. No, I think it's great. I actually don't have any question. Speaking of how you can scale it, like, you know, to different uh, locations, of course, like car loans and then even for cell phones or anything, right? Yes, we are also doing a, a lot of referrals. Uh, for example, we also refer uh, law firms for all the legal proceedings. We refer to uh, insurance for home insurance, for fire insurance, et cetera. We also do renovation referrals. So there's basically all kinds of things that you do with uh, 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 purchasing a home. We have some sort of referral uh, in place. Great, thank you. And last question from Eric. I'm sorry, Eric, we can't hear you yet. Thank you. Sure. Sounds like you're going deep into Hong Kong, um, but sort of the growth path is more lateral, you know, other products, uh, but same sort of client base. Um, how do you sort of see going geographic, you know, as, as a growth or is it better basically phase one is just to stick to Hong Kong? Uh, I think our phase one is stick to Hong Kong because as we discussed, Hong Kong is a market that is enough for us to survive and to, uh, to, to look into the other uh, markets. We've also been invited with Cyberport to uh, Taiwan, the FinTech show, that uh, we can potentially go into the market as well because we have been, been talked with the FinTech department over in Taiwan, which is a similar demographic, although the prices are lower, but they also have the same problem with mortgages and affordability in terms of buying and purchasing homes in, over in mm. Taiwan. Great. Great. Thank you. And thank you all for your presentations. Thank you to the judges for your questions um, and, uh, and getting those great responses and clarification. Welcome back, judges. I want to take a moment to thank the judges again of the Hong Kong semifinal stop of the startup competition, Akina from Great Eagle, Antonio from King Wai Group, Andrew from Sino Group, and Eric from Union Investments. Um, you guys were great. I was just complimenting you in the jury room. Um, great questions. And yes, it's great to have a woman in some diversity on here, Akina. You did uh, terrifically. We really appreciate it everybody's contributions and thank you to Union Investment for, uh, for the, uh, the sponsorship. Um, um, it's, been, it's been great working with you all. And without further ado here, we are going to announce the finalists who will move on to Cannes for the Global Startup Competition uh, Big Stage in the Data and Startup category. The winner is Tower 360. Congratulations, Tower. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really excited. Thanks so much. And uh, looking forward to connect each one of, one of you uh, individually and uh, looking forward to, uh, to long term, uh, like, also see how you guys are, are, are working. And, and, and as we have plans to, for Asia as well, um, looking forward to connect with you guys individually on that. And, we're really excited for the next steps. Thanks so much. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so we're going to go through the winners, and then we're going to come back and do photos, if that's OK. So so everybody stay on, please. I'm on video right now. Sorry. Investment startup category. The winner is RealX. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. I'm glad you missed the year. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, to all the judges. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. In the third subcategory, sustainability startups, the winner is Urbanetic. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to connecting with all of you. Excellent.
and Seba. Thank you. And the fourth subcategory winner for the user experience category is Roots. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I hope uh, this time we can actually use the Expedia tickets now. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. All right, so uh, we're going to do some photos uh, now, screenshot photos of the Yeah, I think we lost Aaron, but yeah, if you can all set up your your uh, screen for the the last uh, the last picture all together. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I guess we are all almost here. Perfect. I think you're all here. That's great. So give your give your best smile and and again thank you very much to all of you for this amazing time at the startup competition in Hong Kong. Okay, very much. Thank, thank you all. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations. Bye. 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 Thank you. Congratulations to all our winners. Thank you to our jury. A special happy birthday to Antonio Chan. It's his birthday today. Thanks again to our audience for staying with us. This brings an end to our program today. I look forward to the opportunity of welcoming you in person at MIPAM in Cannes or MIPAM Asia later this year. With Chinese New Year just less in two weeks' time, let me take this opportunity to wish all of you good health and prosperity in the year of the ox. Until we meet again, take care and stay healthy. Goodbye. The whole industry is this week in the south of France. MIPIM has always been kind of the vanguard of showing where the future may go. In four days, you probably have as many meetings as you would have during three or four months. So this is a business accelerator. We meet with a lot of people. We have opportunity to do leasing, buying, selling, financing. Every year there's something new that I'll discover but there's no place like this uh, to keep the pulse of what's happening on, in the industry. The real attraction is you've got people from all the different elements of the real estate sector, architects, surveyors, developers, investors, and I think it's a great way for that community to come together. MIPIM is also always looking at new themes, whether it be prop tech, new business models, the, the evolution of the real estate sector generally. To really talk about where the industry is going, certainly in terms of the property and the, the commercial markets. It's going to be much more about the productivity within spaces, the experience. So we have to transform ourselves into a innovative technology-based uh, industry. The future has to be with smart cities and places that people actually want to live. You're creating much more value by creating a place that has a synergy, that has the capability of establishing a lifestyle pattern. I don't think this sector will ever do without personal interaction, but tech will become more and more important. The real value of people will be around the interpretation of the data, the preparation and formulation of strategy. Frankly, events like MIPIM, I think, will become more significant because they will be those opportunities to be face-to-face. -face. Business, contacts, friendships. Imagine a world without MIPIM. The network here at MIPIM is always the best. Uh, you get everyone from all the different industries, the related industries. I don't deny there's some strange evolutionary
Thank you.